Hi, and welcome to our Today All Day Mind Matters special. You know, this month we're celebrating mental health awareness, a very important topic for everyone, but especially young people here in America. The youth mental health crisis is all too real. So we want to celebrate the people helping to fight it and normalize those conversations. Good example, musician M. Byhold. You may have heard her song, Numb Little Bug. It's her debut single. It's everywhere. It's about M's experience with antidepressants. The earworms blow up TikTok, prompting fans to share their own mental health stories. Last year I had a song called Groundhog Day that was doing well on TikTok and all of a sudden like labels were reaching out and my dreams were coming true very quickly but at the same time I had started on antidepressants and I didn't realize that they could take the highs away as well as the lows and um, I had a conversation with my mom where I was like my dreams are coming true why am I not as happy as I expect to be and she was saying that sounds a little bit ungrateful and I was saying, it's not ungrateful, let me find the words for you, and then basically wrote Numb Little Bug. Do you ever get a little bit tired of life? Like you're not really happy, but you don't want to die. Like the viral TikTok launched singer-songwriter M. Byhold into stardom. Like your body's in the room, but you're not really there. Like you have empathy inside, but you don't really care. Like you're fresh out of love, but it's been in the air. I'm a past repair. In February, the single captured number one on Spotify's Global Viral 50 chart. And in April, Numb Little Bug landed M at the top of Billboard's Emerging Artist chart. Today, the song has been streamed nearly 250 million times. Do you remember the first time a fan came up to you and said, M, I heard your song Numb Little Bug, and it affected me in, what did they say? During the tour, um, I had a few people come up to me and tell me that like they had tried to commit suicide last year and had, you know, kind of recovered and, and found help, but also found my music. And that's the most meaningful thing I can get out of any of it. The fact that they like felt they had support through what I was writing. And those are probably honestly my favorite moments from tour. And I'm obviously, I'm so happy that they're still here and getting help. What is your history with mental health? Is there any from your childhood or when you look back on your, your young life, do things come to mind? Um, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety, but I also feel like a lot of people in this generation have it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Let's go anxiety on. society, sister. We're, we're part of it. Me too. <laughs> yes, sir. But it was getting to a point uh, during the pandemic where I was like, I had a mood tracker app and I had so many lows every day that I was like, I need to do something about this. And I had an appointment with a psychiatrist and within 15 minutes she prescribed the meds and I, I was kind of taken aback that it, you know, didn't take a longer conversation to, to do something as drastic as that, but I was willing to try. Did you think about other alternative ways to kind of deal with this as far as maybe going to therapy or whatnot? Um, I've talked to a few therapists and, and still haven't found the right person for me yet, but it is an active search. And I mean, I tried different versions of the medication and just decided that wasn't the route for me. But again, for some people it really is. It, I think it's just finding what's best for you and also making sure you talk to the people around you as well. And what role has music played in your mental health journey? Music has always been my form of therapy. It's just, it's the way that I process my emotions best. It's a flow state when I'm writing and there's nothing quite like it. I have it on good authority that at your concert last night, you actually have another song that's unreleased called One, Two, Three, Four, Five that also deals with the nature of mental health. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, I wrote one, two, three, four, five with a couple of friends of mine about panic attacks and using the, the counting to five method uh, to get over them. Because I've had my own experience, not to the worst extent of panic attacks, but you know, where you, you get like choked up and you can't breathe and the whole world yeah. kind of caves in on you a little bit. And no, well, I, I have this phrase that's like dance through your depression. Like I, I think we need to sort of band together and find positive ways to describe these really tough things that are going on. My generation has a history of, and, and others, of, of not discussing these issues. So we, we hide that. That's where that suffering in silence idea comes from, and the stigma on mental health. I mean, I love your bravery in, in the writing of the song and the recording of your personal feelings, how you do it with such courage, and you're so unabashed about it. And look, that's so relatable. Do you feel like your generation has a better time of discussing the topics of mental health? Oh, for sure. I mean, I remember I was making a video and I had a pill bottle in it and my parents were like, are you sure you want to show the pill bottle in this video? Because that's a sign of weakness. I mean, that's just what their generation grew up on and that makes sure. sense. But I was like, we just talk about it and we laugh about it because that's the only way 
to get through, I mean, in, in my mind. So I have no shame <laughs> attached. Oh, I love it. What did your family say about Numb Little Bug when they heard it, the whole thing? I think the first time they were like, wow, you're really, you're really saying all that. And I was like, yeah. Um, but I think as they've seen the response and the comments and the DMs and people saying like, you know, after hearing this, I went to therapy or I talked to my family, I think they get it now. Like a numb little bug that's got to survive, that's got to survive. Access to mental health resources is another major hurdle for black and brown communities. And even just talking about the topic can still feel very taboo. So I spoke to one inspiring teacher in Los Angeles about the creative ways that he's bringing those desperately needed resources to his own community and students. Take a look. Whenever you decide to go to therapy, whatever you do, you want to know the questions to ask to find the right therapist for you. But a lot of times we don't know the questions to ask. It's the same thing finding your favorite restaurant, finding a pair of shoes that fit you gotta try if you want. For BJ Williams, mental health is a calling. So BJ, your friends and family know you as the mental health guy, huh? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm the mental health <laughs> dude. How did that happen? Uh, man, you know what? I actually started when I started going to therapy for myself, and then I started doing this work that I'm doing now, and so yeah, that gave me the moniker of the mental health guy. My initial uh, intro into therapy was actual couples therapy with a girlfriend. In, in, during that time, my older brother died by suicide. And I left that relationship and a week later got into individual therapy. Your, your friends, like what did your friends think about you going to therapy? Did you tell them? Yeah, it was great. They were very supportive. And then I found out that some of them had gone before as kids or as teens. They just never spoke right. about it. And here I am, I'm like, yo, man, I gotta go to therapy today. And all of a sudden it was, yeah, B, I went to therapy before. And I was like, well, why, how come you didn't say anything to us about it? So it kind of just opened up the, the, the conversation within, within my network. Why do you think that? Why do you think people aren't forthcoming about going to therapy? There's a stigma behind it, specifically, uh, especially, not specifically, especially in, in black and brown communities, especially amongst men. And so it's one of those things that, that are, you know, stigmatized and that we are afraid to say because like, it's either you're crazy, you're on pills, or we write it off. But instead of writing it off, BJ kept the conversation going. As a teacher at Jefferson High School in South Central Los Angeles, he saw his students struggling with their mental health. There's nobody on this planet that doesn't have some form of struggle, right? But I'm in the underserved, you know, what would be considered a uh, poverty level community at a, at a high school that's one of the oldest high schools in LA. Um, and I know this, that the makeup of the, uh, of the school is mainly Hispanic Latina. We lack uh, resources here, you know, we lack school materials here. We lack a bunch of things. So he launched the Can I Be Vulnerable bus in March. Its first stop, Jefferson High School. So we provide the community with questions to go on the bus and interview a mental health professional. So that way, when they're ready to embark on their own journey, they at least have some knowledge on what questions to ask. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, black Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health issues, but are less likely to receive mental health help. And more than half of Hispanic young adults with serious mental illness may not receive treatment. There is still that family stigma that the kids themselves probably recognize that their parents or their guardians probably are still on the, the, the stigma of you can't be crazy, we can't afford to be crazy, that's for white people, we, you know what I mean, like we don't have access, that kind of thing. I'm reading your shirt, but tell me about that. Can I be vulnerable? What's the, what's the history with that? Can I be vulnerable is my mental health platform. Uh, it started off as a uh, docu-series, actually. Um, I recorded about 50 plus black men, and I let just them just talk about their mental and emotional health journey with a very personal story. Can I be vulnerable? Yes, you can. Will you be vulnerable? Well, you should. Um, we did that for like a year and a half, and then it kind of evolved into some other things. Uh, we created a curriculum for high school students. What does "Can I Be Vulnerable" mean to you? <laughs> Funny. Uh, it's 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 a question, and it's also a statement. So for me now, when I say "Can I Be Vulnerable," I'm probably going to say something real. Like I'm I'm going to get emotional with you. I'm going to tell you something. I want to share me with you. So when I say, can I be vulnerable, that means listen up, because I'm about to, we're about to get into a conversation, something that I need to hear, or I, would just, I want you to know about me. How did the bus come about? I was thinking how to further do the work. And I was like, I don't, why don't you just taco truck this thing? Why don't you just bring the people? It was a very simple concept. How about I put mental health professionals on a bus and take them to the community like the ice cream man? And that's basically where it started. <laughs> I, it was nothing profound other than that. Right. 
I'm thinking of Eddie Murphy. Mom, throw down some money. <laughs> that ice cream is. Uh, yeah, here. like it was really just that. I was like, you know what? Mental treats for the for the kids, man. I think it's brilliant. That's really what it was. I was like, yeah, if I had a theme song, they know it's going to be mental health coming. When you were done with your event at Jefferson, did you hear back specifically from any students? What did they tell you? They liked it. One, <laughs> they felt it was needed. Two. They would definitely go on a bus again, but more specifically, they do plan on going on a mental health journey. Um, having somebody that looks like them was really encouraging. They felt more at ease. There's an important part here about cultural competent care, right? I mean, that's at the essence of this. Yes, yes. And depending on what community we go to, I'll reach out to the mental health resources in that community so that they can do the work. I just have two office spaces on a bus. Um, but essentially, it could be resourcing where these social workers provide resources to the community on where they can get access to care, either free or you know sliding scale, or provide something themselves. On the other end, it's uh, it's educational as well. I didn't expect the kids to get on board to and just open up, but we also had you know mental health professionals that looked like them. I had a black man, I had a black woman, I had a Hispanic woman. They spoke the language, and I think that helped tremendously. Hey, do you think that the, like this this particular generation of young people that that you work with? and talk to and know, do you think this is the generation that can really help destigmatize the mental health issue in the black community? I truly believe that the next generation looking at us do this work and will continue on and will definitely do it. Since its launch, BJ's mental wellness bus has made more stops around Southern California and Las Vegas. BJ plans on keeping those conversations and his bus rolling. And that's the thing about it, if you build it, they will get there eventually because I've been noticing like again with my bus people have been asking me B when are you coming here when are you come here this is great but I do think the future of it is bright I, I do think this can be something that can go worldwide honestly that is a stud right there that's BJ Williams he's got big plans for that bus and that community we appreciate his time and efforts out in California coming up next we're going to check back in with Ohio State's Harry Miller Welcome back to our Mind Matters Mental Health Special. Today we're focusing on the people who are pushing the conversation forward on young people and mental health. On the surface, college football player Harry Miller seemed to have it all, but the offensive lineman struggled with his mental health behind the scenes, opening up about his football retirement on the Today Show in March. Sadly, he's not alone in his mental health struggles. We caught up with Harry to talk about how he's doing and what needs to happen now when it comes to athletes and mental health. I don't think it can just be college football because there's been so many other athletes from different sports who have shared the same thoughts. So it's all within college athletics. In recent months, a series of high profile athletes across the US dying by suicide, raising questions about what can be done to better help student athletes manage their mental health. I wish I had the foresight to diagnose what was going on. I think the worst part is when we don't talk about it.
I've been in the sphere of seeing psychiatrists or mental health professionals since I was young, since I was eight years old or so. Um, but prior to the season last year, I was in I was in a pretty poor spot, and perhaps poor is an understatement. Harry's been on the football path since he was little. While it started off as just an after-school activity, he later found himself struggling under the pressure. I remember a coach one time during recruiting when I was a junior came up to me and talked about the NFL. I remember like in that moment, um, I don't know, you just feel sort of the, the weight of the hand you've been dealt. Some of those prophecies feel like death sentences. And you're like, there's no way out of this. Everybody thinks this is what I am and I've got nowhere to go now. Last season, he hit his breaking point. So I, I spoke with my coach, Coach Day, our head coach at Ohio State, and um, was just honest and straightforward with him. I was depressed and anxious and I had suicidal thoughts and um, over the course of what was the season essentially, I was, I was receiving help for that. And I think back about how could I have been so sad and have felt so awful that I, that I would have wished not to be here. So he retired from football. Harry, in March, when you said that you're gonna not play football for medical reasons and you got the courage and you actually did it, what did that feel like? Yeah, it felt awesome because um, it felt like taking a mask off. And prior to that, having to wear a mask, I gave up the stuff that was not for me to begin with. And because yeah. of that, I'm just extremely, I'm extremely grateful and it's honest and it feels, and it feels great. When you were on the Today Show and you shared your story, what was it like when you like got off TV, like what was the reaction to that? It was huge, a huge response. I had high schoolers talking about their experience. I had other college athletes talking about their experience. I had middle-aged men talking about how they wanted to take their own lives. I, I don't know, I don't know many issues um, that spread across every demographic like mental health does. Yeah. And it's our hearts, it's our souls, and it's and every single one of us. What does your mental health like toolkit look like? What works for you? Do you go to treatment? What do you do? I would say I have some some like logical backstops in my head now. I just think of all the people who love me. I think of my mother and my father, my brother, my girlfriend and my friends. For me, it feels like I, I sort of hiked forward a few miles and got the layout of the land and I'm hoping to just come back and say, like, you don't have to keep going this way. There's a better route than this. At Ohio State, Harry still trains with his teammates each morning, and the football staff has begun a suicide prevention training, which will equip them with the tools necessary for responding appropriately to someone in crisis. QPR, question, persuade, refer. It's a way to save lives. It's a way to give people hope. With the pressure of playing collegiate football lifted from his shoulders, Harry is focusing on his education. Someday, he wants to be a Rhodes Scholar. And he's enjoying his hobbies, from reading classic works of literature to playing guitar. If I'm sad, there's a sad song to play. And if I'm happy, there's a happy song to play. And um, I don't have to put it into words. And it's, it's, it's already there. For anybody who stumbles upon this and, um, and watches it and is struggling with their own demons, what do you say to somebody like that? There is nothing so absolute as as suicide and i remember i was talking to my friend um when i was in a bad a bad way and um he just said give it another day and um that became a sort of motto of ours to just give it another day what a great guy and such an inspiration Appreciate Harry. Coming up next on Mind Matters, we're going to show you two different apps trying to help teens' mental health.
So today on Mind Matters, we're shining a light on the people working to solve the youth mental health crisis and eliminate the stigma around discussing the topic. Now, part of that battle includes, of course, meeting young people where they are, where they frequently are. And where's that? Yeah, their phones. So we wanted to highlight two apps they're helping out. Every teen should have Teen Talk. After school, 16-year-old Lana Garrido logs into Teen Talk and gets to work. It's kind of an outreach app where like teens can use it as like a resource whenever like they're in a crisis or like they need someone to talk to. On the app, teens can anonymously post about what's bothering them, whether it's mental health or relationship problems or issues with friends. From there, Lana and hundreds of other teens work as teen advisors, trained to respond empathetically and offer resources and coping techniques peer-to-peer. -peer. Teen advisors receive 50 hours of training and are supported by licensed mental health professionals who can step in if a user is in crisis. 17-year-old Serena Guerrero has been a Teen Talk advisor since 2020. There's a shared understanding of what high school is like. There's a shared understanding of how friend groups can be. And that's something that I don't think that you can always get from an adult, no matter how much you trust them. The app is offered through the Jewish Big Brothers Big Sisters of Los Angeles organization. Teen Talk app was started four years ago in response to a growing need that we saw for teens to receive mental health support. And to date, we've reached over 40,000 teens in the last four years. At the start of the pandemic, the surging number of new users crashed the app, which had to be rebuilt to accommodate its new user base. We've also seen that for a lot of teens, just having a conversation with a peer about what they're going through can be a protective factor that allows them not to go down a path of more mental health challenges, more anxiety, more depression, that it actually prevents that. And that mental health support and validation can go both ways. What made me want to join Teen Talk was, it was a personal experience. Um, I struggled with an eating disorder myself. And I feel like through my journey with mental health, I kind of wanted to be that person I wish I had when I was struggling. I feel like I was able to relate with other kind of teens who are going through like similar things. Sometimes it's not even about eating disorders. It could be something about like body dysmorphia or like kind of body related issues. And I feel like that definitely kind of helped me heal from that experience. So one of the lessons that we go over in training and in our continued education classes are dealing with people who struggle to come out as part of the LGBTQ community. The way Teen Talk was just able to make that feels so normal. It really empowered me to come out to um, friends and family. Um, and I, I didn't know at the time how much hiding that part of, hiding that part of myself um, was affecting me until I was able to come out. The app wants to break multiple stigmas around getting mental health help and show that sometimes being on your phone is a good thing. The reality is that teens have a smartphone, they're on their phone and they're on social media. And we wanna make sure that Teen Talk app is what they're accessing because it's safe and it's really a good resource for them. Social media does have a bad reputation and I see it on our app. I see teens coming to us about being very insecure about the way they look because they see all these photoshopped models on Instagram, TikTok. However, Teen Talk, you don't see anyone. There's no talk about what makeup brands to use. On the app, you come on and you see other teens posting about things that they're struggling with. That urge to strip away all the gloss and Photoshop on our feeds, powering another app called Be Real. Once a day, at a random time, users get a notification that simply says, time to be real. At that moment, you've got two minutes to snap a pic. Your phone's front camera captures what you're doing, no matter how mundane while the rear-facing camera captures a selfie of you. It's really like just a snippet in someone's life. It's just a snapshot. Maybe I just got out of the shower or like I'm in the middle of working out or something. You know, nobody's photo is gonna be of them in like full glam, you know, like looking their best. You, I think it's sort of an unspoken rule that we're all gonna do it and be, you know, our just like natural selves. Even though the app launched in early 2020, it really skyrocketed this year 
growing 315% since January 1st, according to Aptopia. For college sophomore Juliana Cofferella, she says it's a way to share a more real part of her life with close friends, like when she got a notification during her aunt's funeral. So I like quickly snapped just like a picture of like just my eyes up um, and they were like really puffy from crying at a funeral. But you know, those are things at like slightly more vulnerable moments. Be Real is marketed as an alternative to addictive social networks. It won't make you famous, the company bluntly states. If you want to become an influencer, you can stay on TikTok and Instagram. It's definitely not as draining on your mental health. You know, it's not these like curated images from celebrities or influencers or anything. Like it's really just your friends um, that, you know, you're not getting that sort of outside pressure to be something that you're not. Two apps trying to foster better mental health for teens. Hopefully both of those great apps will inspire more just like them. That's going to do it for our Mind Matters special. We certainly hope that these stories inspire you to please keep the conversation going with your loved ones. To find trusted mental health resources, that's a hard thing to do. If you're looking for those resources near you, we encourage you to visit Project Healthy Minds. I'm on the board. They're doing some great work, and they can help you hook up with those resources. You can find more information at today.com slash mindmatters. We appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. this morning that the so-called Mediterranean diet, it can sharply reduce your chances of developing dementia, even if you have a genetic risk for it. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar here, is here to tell us about the new study and that could have us eating healthier. What encouraging news. Yeah. I mean, what, anything can fight back against dementia and Alzheimer's, but this is a diet that a lot of people have been on or are on. Absolutely, Hoda. It is definitely another vote for the Mediterranean diet. So this study looked at over 60,000 individuals who were middle-aged um, and followed them for about nine years. Ooh. And there were close to 900 cases of dementia. People who followed strictly a Mediterranean diet had almost a quarter lower chance of developing dementia. And as you said in the lead, they actually took into account genetic risk, and that didn't even make a difference, which is really, really encouraging because you think that certain things are predetermined, mm -hmm. but this is the kind of thing that we can all actually implement in our lives. Can you remind everybody what the Mediterranean yeah. Yeah. diet is and, and then why it might have affected something to do with your brain health? Right. So, so the Mediterranean diet, think plant-based. Okay, Ooh. so we're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, seeds, legumes, things like that, fish, seafood, olive oil. You want to limit or eat in moderation red meat, eggs, poultry, cheese, yogurt, and sweets. Why is it? Well, you know, some people have said maybe it's not a direct effect on the brain, but maybe because it's reducing inflammation, it's, oh, it wow. has antioxidants, that it's helping your heart health, that helps the blood vessels in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know exactly why, but nonetheless, this is very compelling. It was such a large study. Besides the, the change of diet, are there yes. ways that, that folks might be able to reduce the likelihood that they develop Alzheimer's or, or dementia? Absolutely. And all of these things, again, are lifestyle changes, getting adequate sleep, controlling your blood mm -hmm. pressure, controlling cholesterol, 
cholesterol, your blood glucose, staying physically and mentally active. These are all things that can help with cognitive decline and hopefully stave off oh. risk of dementia. Okay, okay. Thanks. thank Thanks. you, Dr. Thanks. Natalie. Thanks. Diet can play a big part in our ability to stay sharp and may even reduce your risk of cognitive diseases such as Alzheimer's. Here's a look at how the foods we choose can impact our ability to focus and function. We have all felt that dreaded mid-afternoon slump, and it turns out there's a reason for it. What's happening in the brain when you feel this slump is it doesn't have the fuel it needs. The fuel that you're providing all have an impact on whether or not your brain will be as sharp as it humanly can be. That fuel comes in the form of food. 20% of the calories you consume go toward brain function, which needs specific nutrients to focus and function fully throughout the day. What goes into our bodies is almost certainly going to reflect itself in our brains. We're in an era now where we can get all kinds of processed, packaged foods that aren't necessarily what our bodies have evolved to deal with. To keep our health maximal, what you want to do is eat naturally. Research shows that people who eat a primarily plant-based diet are more likely to experience brain-boosting benefits both short-term and long-term. The clearest evidence of benefit and risk reduction revolves around the MIND diet and the Mediterranean diet, which have both been studied quite well and show good effects. MIND diet stands for Mediterranean Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's broken down into a list of healthy foods like leafy greens, beans, nuts, whole grains, fatty fish, having about two servings of berries every day actually help to reduce cognitive decline by about two and a half years. Of course, there are foods to limit too. Things you want to avoid are going to be anything that is high in sugar, refined carbohydrates, so white pasta, white bread, obviously any sugary drinks. You want to limit the amount of overall saturated fat that's coming into your diet, typically coming from meats, animal products such as high fat dairy, things of that nature. 75% of the brain is made up of water, so what you drink is important too. Many times when people say they feel drained of energy or they're hungry, they're just dehydrated. Water is really critical as a drink. Coffee is great. Any kind of tea will have benefit. In the short term, there's no doubt that caffeine improves processing speed and helps with attention. A lifetime habit of caffeinated beverages may be protective against brain disorders later. Psychologically, people see the effects of a diet shift pretty rapidly. They start feeling better, they start having more energy, and this cascades into all sorts of other things in life, like how happy you are and how well you're sleeping at night. So when people shift their diets so that they're eating well, it really matters. A brain-healthy diet may also help prevent cognitive diseases, like Alzheimer's, which is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. 64-year-old Debbie Morden has a history of Alzheimer's in her family. My father had Alzheimer's for 12 years. His brother had Alzheimer's and three of his first cousins had Alzheimer's. Debbie has tested positive for an Alzheimer's gene and is taking a proactive approach. She's seen an Alzheimer's prevention specialist who recommended the MIND diet. That gene means I have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. I went on basically a vegan diet except for fish. I've cut out dairy and I'm eating more grains and more legumes, increasing olive oil and a daily intake of berries and also lowered alcohol to four ounces of red wine a couple times a week. After eight months, Debbie has significantly lowered her cholesterol and hopes her new diet will ward off cognitive deterioration. I watched my father for 12 years decline. The whole thing with, with Alzheimer's, it starts developing 10 to 20 years before you see signs of it. So you want to start preventing it as early as possible. I'm making the changes because I want to live a healthy life as long as I can and enjoy it. Whether you're 85 or you're eight, now is the time to start building that base. Diet can prevent certain things. And I never want to have a conversation with my patient where they've developed something and we didn't have the years to work into that prevention factor. It's something you have to commit to and do it for the long haul. We always say we want a brain span to match your lifespan. For more on the Mind Diet, head to hodaandjenna.com.
here with Moore, the author of This Is Your Brain on Food, Dr. Uma Naidu. Welcome, Dr. Naidu. Hi, Dr. Naidu. Uh, thank you so much, Jenna and Hoda. I'm a big fan, so oh. I'm excited to be here. That thank is so you. sweet. Okay, you know what? I I sort of like know in theory how this works because I know when I eat terrible food the night before, I wake up the next day and I feel even worse. And my goal in eating that terrible food is to soothe myself mm -hmm. at night. For eating. So there's a real direct correlation between your gut and your brain. Exactly. You know, Hoda, you'd be surprised to know that some people call the gut the second brain. Mm. And here's why. They have a profound influence on one another, and they actually have the same origin in the body. So I think that's something useful for people to know when they, you know, when they make a decision about what to eat. Mm. Okay. So w we wake up in the morning. Sometimes we have those days where we're feeling sluggish, yeah. we're not motivated. Yeah. And I've noticed that if I eat certain things... I feel yeah. worse. Yeah. So, but what can we eat to make us start our day on the right path? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because I think we're all feeling a little bit th of that these days. I like to add spices. So, you know, you could add things like black pepper, cinnamon, and ginger, which are actually ingredients of my grandmother's chai tea recipe, but mm. they're great to kind of liven things up. Also things like saffron, which can be added. It's a great aromatic. It can be added to a risotto or adding, you know, things like rosemary and sage to a roasted to roasted veggies can help liven things up for you and make you, because what you're trying to do is feel more alert and, um, you know, feel, feel more energy as well. What would you say is like the best breakfast if you want to start the day mm -hmm. right? So I actually love uh, either something like a chia pudding or, you know, chia pudding, a little bit of coconut milk and topped with um, lots of different nuts. And my favorite go-to nuts that are great brain foods are either hazelnuts or macadamia. And, you know, a simple thing like that that you can even make ahead is mm -hmm. a great way to, you know, you can plan for the week, uh, set out your little chia puddings and you have them ready to go. So we have been talking all morning about how people are more anxious than ever. Mm -hmm. What are some foods that can actually help soothe anxiety? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think the uncertainty is what's so difficult for people, and this is where fiber is your friend. Mm. Um, so adding in fiber-rich foods that you get from, you know, vegetables, um, certain berries, uh, beans, nuts, seeds, and legumes, those help to sort of even out your, um, your blood sugar levels because they break down more slowly in the body. But it's also important to know things to avoid when you're feeling anxious. Yes. And what I like to remind people about here is that there's sometimes hidden sources of caffeine that we don't think about, um, such as, you know, sodas that have caffeine or other beverages, and then things like, um, you know, chocolate could have caffeine. And mm -hmm. um, some over-the-counter headache pills as well. Mm -hmm. So you want, you want to try to avoid these if you're feeling super anxious and you're feeling stressed. What if you're feeling just down? You don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a funk or whatever. And usually in those yeah. moments, that's when you go for the comfort yes, food that like really sweets. take you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's a long rabbit hole. So, so I, I like to suggest things that people can do right now. You know, adding prebiotic or probiotic rich foods, which are fermented foods, um, into your diet even right now can really help you and start to make a difference. Um, but, you know, I also think the same thing with depression, Hoda and Jenna. I think that also knowing things to avoid becomes super important. And here's where I want people to know that there are actually a lot of studies that show that sugar is associated quite profoundly with levels of depression. Mm. And um, things like, you know, nitrates, which you find in processed meats, um, are also uh, linked to depression. So maybe cut back on those foods and add back, you know, prebiotic rich foods and probiotics, which are usually fermented foods, like, like a fear, unsweetened, and things like that. Like what, what were the pre or probiotic foods that are, we can try? So prebiotic foods are like garlic, leeks, onions, um, you know, it's different types of vegetables. And these feed the good bugs in your gut and help and really help you stave off symptoms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then probiotics are usually usually a supplement, but fermented foods um, are rich in these active cultures and things like miso, kimchi, unsweetened kefir, sauerkraut, um, kombucha mm. are all good options for you. Oh, so okay. I think a lot of people are having a hard time sleeping. Mm -hmm. Some I, I used to drink chamomile tea before mm -hmm. bed. Let's talk about things that are good for sleep and then mm -hmm. the benefits of chamomile tea. Absolutely. So chamomile, you know, the great aroma really helps us to de-stress and it's well known 
I also have another tip about de-stressing, which is turmeric with black pepper, a pinch of black pepper. And you can add it to a soup or smoothie. And why turmeric with a pinch of black pepper? It hits the high notes on so many conditions in mental wellness. So that's that's one of my go-tos. Okay. Great. Dr. Naidu, thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate you. Okay, are you ready to feel your best yet? If the answer is yes, we've got some power foods to tell you about that can improve your overall health and wellness. We're talking about immunity, sleep, brain health, all the things Max. So Lugavere is a health and science journalist. His recent book is called Genius, Genius Kitchen. Kitchen. First of all, I love the fact that the things we need are right in front of us, right in the fridge, right in the supermarket that can actually help us physically. We're always taking pills if we have yeah. a problem. We're not working the front food end. Food is medicine. is such yeah. a cool way to think yeah. about life, right? It is. I mean, yeah, food is so powerful. I mean, with, with every bite you take, you are essentially either feeding or fighting disease. And so I'm here to pre present some of what I think are the most powerful foods available to most most people in your average okay. supermarket. Okay. Mushrooms, yeah. they're all over the place. Yeah, so mushrooms can actually be used to balance immune function, to foster better immunity. Wow. So there are a few mechanisms here which are, are still being elucidated, yeah. but essentially some mushrooms create vitamin D, which can tamper down an overactive immune response. Mm -hmm. But I think most interestingly, mushrooms like mushrooms. lion's mane, sure. which are typically pretty available, they actually create antioxidants that we produce in our own bodies, one of which is called glutathione. It's uh -huh. considered the mother of all antioxidants. It helps to detox. Mm. And and reduce What's, oxidative which stress. Which one's lion's mane? This one? So That's oyster, right? Yeah. So oh, we have... Is we that have, lion mane? That's not a lion's mane. No, yeah. lion's mane actually has like a... It has the consistency of crab, fresh crab. It's oh. really, By really By the way, tasty. whatever this one is... It's really good. I want to keep eating it. Here's a tip. Actually, you don't want to rinse mushrooms. You just want to... You just oh, want eat to them a little dirty. dirty? Cook them, yeah. Eat them a little dirty with some nice uh, okay. butter or olive okay. oil. Okay, move on to kiwi. kiwi. So here we've got kiwi. Kiwi can be used to promote better digestion and good sleep. So we're seeing clinical trials Ooh, now wow. that two kiwi a day... Yeah, actually in a head-to-head -head match against psyllium husk, <laughs> Kiwi has been shown to, to help uh, reduce constipation, which a lot oh. of people suffer from. And also, <laughs> yeah, can, can help fight constipation and also improve sleep, too, before Should bed. Should you skin on or off? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Eat the kiwi with the skin what? because skin the skin on. contains Skin's more good. vitamin E. Uh, I've never yeah. eaten a kiwi with skin. Yeah, it's Try good. It. People think that it's weird, but it's, it's actually bad. really tart and delicious. Mm -hmm. You like it's it? It's not bad. You're I don't know bad. that I could force my kids to eat. Wow, it's tart. It's good, it's right? But it balances out the okay. sweet. But what, it, what if the kid done eat it? Is it okay, the middle stuff? Yeah, yeah. the middle is great, okay. too. The middle is great, okay. too. Okay, let's get to these fruits. Okay, so here we have brain foods. So these foods are loaded with compounds called plum. flavonoids, which are plant pigments that are usually in the outer skin. We've got apples, we've got citrus, we've got plums. Berries are a great mm. source of flavonoids. They've been shown to boost BDNF in the blood, which is a, a miracle grow protein that actually helps to support healthy neurons. BDNF, it's BDNF, called? BDNF, yeah. Okay. We produce it in our muscles when we work out. One of the reasons why exercise is so great, but this has actually been shown to boost it. So you never know, an apple a day might keep the neurologist doesn't, away. Doesn't matter, red or green, whatever? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. High Got flavonoid it. foods. Okay, right. let's there go to go. strawberries mm. and almonds. Yeah, so these are anti-aging foods. Strawberries are rich in a compound called fisetin, which is known as a senolytic. So we have in our bodies, all of us, especially as we age, uh, cells called senescent cells okay. that secrete pro-inflammatory compounds that can make, make our skin look uh, more aged. And so these actually fight aging by helping to kill off those <laughs> zombie cells. Yeah. You can actually no, eat. thank you, zombie scales. Mm. And actually, this is actually also very interesting. Strawberry leaves are rich in caffeic acid, which is a very powerful antioxidant. So eat the leaf? So when you yeah, eat you a eat strawberry, you eat the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, I do. And almonds are loaded with magnesium, which 50% of Americans don't consume adequate uh, amounts of. And magnesium can help fight DNA damage. Wow, so, this is again, crazy. Yeah. Okay, hit us with the last one. Okay, so here we've got dark chocolate and coffee. So this, I mean, people are probably at home rejoicing. If I am. Loaded with compounds called flavanols. When you buy dark chocolate, you want to make sure that the cacao percentage is high. And it's not, it hasn't been processed with alkali, also known as Dutch processed, which greatly degrades oh. the health quality of the uh, chocolate. And then from, a, uh, from the standpoint of coffee, coffee's long been associated with better cardiovascular yeah. health, reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. And we now know that, there, that caffeine actually can help promote better lipids in the blood, so better, like, uh, healthier cholesterol levels. Wow.
Welcome back. It is Super Food Friday. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is back, and this week she has not one, not two, but three surprising superfoods that could help boost brain power and enhance your memory. This is exciting. First of all, the role that food plays in terms of our, our memory, in terms of our brain health and all that. Which is a great question. So there's a lot of studies that we have now that are showing that there are certain compounds within foods and beverages okay. that can help to slow cognitive decline and also boost memory, boost brain power it's all good and I'm gonna feature three today let's start with the blueberries blueberries you can tell from their color they are packed with antioxidants and in fact that they rank number one when the USDA did like a huge rally of all of the fruits and vegetables number one, number okay. one. Yeah. and they get their blue color from something called anthocyanins that's the name of the antioxidant and we know that that helps to boost brain power there's actually even a Harvard study that shows if w these women they ate one cup a week that's not a lot mm -hmm. and they had significant increase in their smarts they did all sorts of tests and stuff how easy is that oh, right yeah. you could throw them in pancake batter and muffin yeah. batter on your oatmeal but this is my favorite way classic peanut butter and jelly sandwich swap out the sugary jam oh, and just put whole blueberries and this is so fun out. for your kids huh. no they stick because of the peanut butter mm -hmm. and then um, for kids you can make a tic-tac-toe board oh, this is like the ultimate pre-exam morning breakfast I love that. <laughs> that's a great idea so cocoa powder is the next superfood cocoa powder is like the king of dark chocolate because it's a hundred percent dark chocolate mm -hmm. and they contain something called flavanols it's another type of antioxidant that we know can keep your blood vessels healthy and elastic, which means a healthy heart. And a healthy heart equals a healthy brain, because when your blood vessels are open and elastic and healthy and happy, all of the nutrition goes right up to your brain. You get more oxygen, you get more nutrients. So what I'm gonna show you that you can do is add, it's not sweet, cocoa powder is not sweet and indulgent like dark chocolate, but you could do a lot of things with it. Okay. If you take some and you mix it into, this is just a vanilla low-fat yogurt. Yogurt. Mm -hmm. Two ingredients, and you've Perhaps now some. made a brain boosting chocolate pudding. So, my kids oh. will just think they're having chocolate pudding, just and really. Tell them it's chocolate pudding. Really? Oh, wow. Mm. Isn't that good? Two like ingredients. Now this Doesn't get easier than that. This is the most right. surprising superfood to me. Work. Coffee? Coffee. Al, every single week we are hearing more and more studies showing that yeah. the benefits in terms of brain health for coffee. We used to think it was just the caffeine. We know yeah. that caffeine keeps you alert, it wakes you up, mm -hmm. but it's a combination of the caffeine and the antioxidants within coffee oh. that could help boost brain power. And that's really good news because a lot of people are caffeine sensitive. Mm -hmm. So that means decaf gives you these health perks as well. And all you need is about a half a cup to four cups a day to reap these benefits. So Even you're making a, a breakfast co uh, cookie. I I developed. I'm calling this You're my so excited exclusive. About these. I'm so excited about these cookies. <laughs> these are brain boosting breakfast coffee cookies. This is exclusive to okay. the Today Show. Just to the Today yeah. Show. I'm going to put right. them on Instagram and I'm going to put them on our website. So for the dry ingredients, it's um, whole grain flour. We have cocoa powder, some mm. cinnamon, and we have a little bit of uh, baking powder. And some salt. And some salt, kosher salt. Now I'm adding instant coffee, oh. boom, oh. right into the batter. We're gonna so mix. I thought that was connected to this, but no, this is just instant coffee. This is just instant okay. coffee. You could also use finely powdered regular coffee mm -hmm. as well, but it's easy to buy the instant. So you mix okay. Yeah. What's so the wet ingredients are a lot of usual breakfast foods. I have Greek yogurt. I have eggs. I have mashed banana and a little bit of honey. You mix oh, these two okay. things in, then you fold in your blueberries because oh, all three superfoods are in here. That's Go amazing. taste the cookie. See what you think. Right. Wait, wait. And then a little bit of chocolate good. chips. Each cookie is only 80 oh, wow. calories and comes packed with protein and fiber, so you could have three with a cup of coffee for oh, breakfast. Wow. Fantastic. Wait, Joy, thank three you cookies. so much. Three cookies for breakfast. For these recipes, go to today.com health, and we'll be right back. Cheers. Oh, oh my goodness.
we're going to tell you about five foods to add to your diet to help improve memory, energy levels, and sleep. Dr. Taz Batia is an integrative wellness physician and host of the Superwoman Wellness Podcast. But this is for everybody. Dr. Yes. Taz, good morning. Good morning. So you're saying before we get to it that, that if you start incorporating these into your diet, you'll see results relatively quickly? The beauty about kind of getting your diet right is usually within three weeks, oh. you can see a change. And it can be as quiet as you have more sleep and you have more energy to like you're on and you're focused and ready to go. Wow. What is it about these foods that we're going to look at here? What is it about these particular foods and, and other items that give the brain that boost? Well, what, why we have picked these foods is because we call them superfoods. They just have a ton of nutrients for every serving. Okay. So they're su they're efficient, right? So if you're trying to get these nutrients in, this is an efficient way to do it to keep your brain and your energy superpowered. All right. Our first super ingredient is yes. magnesium. Where do we find that? So magnesium, I always call the miracle micronutrient. It helps us with sleep. It helps calm us down. It helps balance serotonin. Try that. It's Believe so it or not, dark chocolate is going to be uh -huh. one of our best sources. An ounce of it has about 64 milligrams of magnesium okay. in it. Legumes are great. They come in at about 70 milligrams. A tablespoon of flax, which you see right here, mm -hmm. at about 40. Avocado also has magnesium, but less than the dark chocolate. So you, so you have this recipe, these little balls. What are in those then? So it's a lot of cacao, which has a lot of the magnesium mm -hmm. and the antioxidants in it. Almond butter for the healthy fats, flax seeds. Mm -hmm. Mix it up together. Super easy. Has a little bit of oat too. A little dark chocolate. A little in there. dark chocolate in there. So it's yummy, yummy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And not too much calories. No, either, not too many it? calories. No. So we have a chocolate many craving. Calories. You go for Let's it. Let's talk collagen here because yes. collagen, you say, is it's actually naturally occurring in our bodies. We all have it. We've all got collagen. It's naturally occurring. We know it for skin and health, hair and overall health. But it actually helps support the gut lining, helping us to absorb the nutrients. So many people are eating healthy, but they're not absorbing what they're eating. Collagen comes in and helps us with that, helps the brain, helps energy. It's in a lot of naturally occurring proteins. So we've got salmon here, for example, and chicken. You know, these are things that are a great way to get salmon in. This looks like chicken this stock. Is, How would you use it? This is bone broth. Bone so broth. Some people oh. will just drink bro bone broth and get a great Roker, source Roker of collagen. Try a smig. Roker does Wash that out. If, if you're vegetarian, you can get some collagen from your vegetables as well. It's just that we get a lot more through our proteins and through our bone broth. Okay. Uh, uh, these are cruciferous. Those are can cruciferous. you only get the collagen from cruciferous? Not necessarily. Oh. No, yeah. you can get it from other vegetables as well. It's just not as dense. All right, this is a new one on me. Choline. What is that? Why is it good? So choline, I feel like, doesn't get enough press, and I'm so glad we're talking about it today. So choline actually is a nutrient that comes in and coats all our nerves. So it helps us with learning, Never with memory, that. with hmm. focus. And we really want to get choline in our diet. So choline is naturally found in eggs. Eggs are one of the best sources. Huh but you've got to eat the egg yolk. Okay. The yolk has the choline, has about 140 milligrams. We've got mushrooms and burgers here. Which one do you think has more choline? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. You guys win. Good okay. job. So mushrooms actually have more choline How than a burger. How many eggs would you have to eat or mushrooms? Like what's a serving to get enough choline so any given day? So just, this is the beauty of eggs. One full egg, including oh. the yolk, will okay. do it. You need a cup of mushrooms. You actually need two burgers to get the choline. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ooh, I love choline. Mushroom. Yeah. Mushrooms and eggs, I guess. There yeah. we go. This, yes. this is something I've never heard of. Oh, ghee. I've heard of this. I've it's like butter or something? Ghee is uh, it's like butter. That's a great way to think about it. It's clarified butter. It's been used in Eastern systems of medicine for a really long time. And it's been used as a healing fat. Mm. And the reason is, is because ghee actually has less lactose, less casein. So if you've got somebody that's dairy intolerant, yeah. can't tolerate that stuff, they can usually tolerate ghee very well. But the secret superfood ingredient here is MCT, or medium chain triglycerides. That helps the brain. It helps the gut. It balances everything everything living down here in the mm. gut. And that is really the powerhouse, the source of our energy. So if we're not getting some of these healthy fats in, that's one of the biggest reasons I see brain and energy start to go How down. How do you get ghee in your diet? I'm not looking to yes, take a big old no, bite we don't want you, we, And we don't want you Did to you do that. you put it on toast? You can put it on toast. Literally, all you need is about a quarter to a oh, half wait, of a sure teaspoon. That. A tiny little bit. A tiny little teaspoon. You don't need okay. a lot. And you can spread it on something. You, it also has a higher smoke point, so you can bake and fry with it oh, as well. Okay. So you can use it. As as butter. Exactly. Hey guys, welcome to The Boost. We're going to start this morning with a new series for a new year. We're calling this one a day in the life. 
And no better place to start than spotlighting educators in our public school system. Craig Melvin recently shadowed a hardworking middle school teacher whose average day is anything but and emblematic of the millions of educators all across the country. Every day across America, they rise before many of us. 6.15 in the morning here in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. We're about to knock on the door and tag along with the teacher for the day. Hey! hey. Good morning. What's up, How Ryan? Craig Melvin. <laughs> nice to meet you. Ryan Hardesty and his wife, Melissa, Melissa have two sons, Ben and Grayson, still sleeping. Oh, hi, Melissa. It's your neighbor, Craig. <laughs> this reminds me of when I was a kid. Yeah. My mom was a teacher. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So she, awesome. was, she was up at O'Dark 32. So as soon as you get in, it's ground running. Yeah, usually. Um, by the time I drop my son off to get at the babysitter to catch the bus and then uh, kind of run in the door, and usually the kids are there within five or 10 minutes. Soon, we're on our way. Well, what's this area like? Really close-knit community, supportive of the kids, supportive of the school. Hardesty drops his seven-year-old son, Ben, off, and we reach Highland Middle School by 743. This is the office, huh? This is it. Us and, what, 800 of our closest friends. Teaching here was his first job out of college. He's been here 15 years and goes to great lengths to keep his kids engaged in the social studies lessons he teaches. For his work, he was selected by the Pennsylvania Department of Education as the state's Teacher of the Year in 2023. This is very quiet. It's like yeah. Calm oh, before the just storm. Gonna say that. The storm starts at 8.30 with the first class of seventh graders. The right. dim lights are a sign of the times. Interactive right. whiteboards replacing the chalkboards of my day. Each student also has a tablet provided by the school. Right now, they're studying everyday life in ancient Egypt. Part one says you're going to create a narrative, a story. He hovers, advises, trying to get them to build on what they've learned. The second class starts with morning announcements and the Pledge of Allegiance. With liberty and justice for all. Hardesty stays put in room 203 while students move in and out. After two classes of the Pharaohs, he moves on to Lewis and Clark for a class of eighth graders at 10 a.m. There's a lot of participation in Mr. Hardesty's class, moving desks, forming teams to work on projects together. 1045 is study hall. Some students passing the time with cards invite me to play war. I haven't won a hand yet. At 1215, Hardesty gets a half hour for lunch. He spends it in the teacher's room. He may be the teacher of the year, but Hardesty insists many of his colleagues are more deserving of the award. Next, prep period, when we find some time to talk. When did you realize that you, you actually wanted to teach? I think in high school, uh, you know, you look at good social studies teachers that you had and you think, I, I think I'd really like to do that. To be a teacher, it's a little bit about liking the subject that you want to teach, but it's a lot more about wanting to work with kids. How has it changed in, in the 15 years you've, you've been teaching? In the years immediately after COVID, I think you were seeing students just struggle to be in a space with other people and be surrounded by other people all day and be in a chair and a desk and listen to instruction all day. Classes resume at 125 and finish with dismissal at 245. The fleet of yellow buses rumble off in formation. Hardesty picks up his son at his school. Oh, oh, hi, Ben. At 415, Hardesty helps Ben with his homework, followed by playtime in the backyard. After, we sit down with Ryan and Melissa. She's an educator, too, a speech pathologist. You both spend all day working with children that aren't your own, and then you come home and you have two small boys. <laughs> You're surrounded by children every day, all day. Yeah. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we really enjoy it. It's definitely hard. You know, the mental load, it can be a lot. But it's also really rewarding to get to watch kids grow. One day, if, if one of the boys comes to you and they say, you know what? I want to go into education. I want to be a teacher. What would you say? Be honest. I think I'd say go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a great profession. I think it's a great opportunity to make a difference. The day winds down with family dinner at 628, followed by a bedtime story, a final lesson before the day is done. Our spotlight continues with Chanel Jones. She went to her hometown of Wichita, Kansas to meet Miss Pow Pow. 
an educator whose students love her so much, they put her on TikTok so the world would fall in love with her too. When I walked into the classroom to interview her yesterday, I was like, wait, I know her. Like, not only do I know her, I went to elementary school, middle school, and high school with her. I was like, Shay? <laughs> so now she's affectionately known as Miss Pow Pow. Her name is Miss Lachey Powell. And she went viral on TikTok. Not just viral, she had 10 million views. As you can see, her students love her, and you're about to see why. That is the moment high school history teacher Lachey Powell went viral on TikTok. What is this? Wait, go ahead. The video viewed over 10 million times shows sophomores at Northeast Magnet High School near Wichita surprising their beloved teacher with a special gift. I just lost it. I, and, and I had no idea what was going on. I didn't even know what was in the bag. It was just the idea of the thank you. I opened it and I was like, wait, I can see those, those numbers, like those numbers are saying everything. So what was in the bag? A customized Steelers jersey, Miss Powell's favorite team. Miss <laughs> Powell, affectionately known as Miss Pow Pow by her students, isn't afraid to rock the Steelers black and gold in Chiefs country. It's a fandom that started decades ago during a chance meeting with the then young quarterback for the University of Colorado. I was able to meet Cordell Stewart. I was 12 or 13. I was like, oh, he's going to be my husband. I'm going to grow up and marry Cordell Stewart. And um, he obviously went to the Steelers, and I was like, well, that's my husband's team. So what is it that makes Miss Powell so special to her students? She pushes us to our full potential. One thing she always preaches is learning and growing. She is a very difficult teacher, but it's because she knows we can do it. And it just teaches us that no matter how hard an assignment is or no matter how hard something can be in life, we can overcome it. Those sentiments echoed by Matt Creaseman, the former principal at Northeast High. She holds students to high standards. She builds great relationships with them. But every now and then you'd have a rough day and one of the ways that I could make myself feel better was to go sit in her class and see what it's all about. Even after teaching for 22 years and working a second job, Ms. Powell hasn't lost her passion. When they understand kind of like the method to your madness, when they get it, it's, it's everything because you can take them to places that they don't even think they can take themselves. One of Ms. Powell's biggest champions, her mom, a frequent visitor at Northeast Magnet. She passed away in 2020. And so many of us remember your mom. She's the reason why I am who I am. She pushed me. She pushed me the way I push my students. And I really do believe it's her spirit, the spirit of um, my mom moving through all these people and all these great things mm. that are happening, saying, Little girl, you did all right. <laughs> I think you did okay. We're going to evaluate him, his job performance. With the outpouring of love for this Steelers diehard in Kansas shows how exceptional Miss Pow Pow really is. Teachers give everything to do this job. It's not for the faint of heart. We thank you for trusting your young people with us. You always question, you always wonder. This is now finally after 22 years saying, you did a good job. You did a good job. I love it. I love it. I love it. What does it mean to you to see all of your students here? This is actually just a fraction of your students and the love that you're getting so far this morning. Oh my gosh. It is. It's it's overwhelming. It means so much. It really does. I don't so well, you mean so much to us. So I think it's time to do something special for Miss Pow Pow. Don't you guys think so? Yeah. All right. So we know you're a Steelers fan, even though you know we're in Kansas City Chiefs country, so I can't even believe I'm doing this. But they know that you're a fan, too. Do they? They do. So they actually want to do something special for you, and they are giving what? you two tickets Don't do to that. an upcoming game, any Don't game you that. want. Yes, they are. Can what? we get them? Yes. <laughs> You know what? what? We actually have someone special to give you the tickets. Is there anybody here that can give her the tickets? Anybody? Oh my God! Okay. Right here.
congratulations. Yes. Anything you would like to say to Miss Pow Pow? Well, Miss Pow Pow. What would you like to say to Miss Pow Pow? Well, Miss Pow Pow, on, on behalf of myself and the oh Pittsburgh Steelers, we would like to present to you two tickets oh to man. one of this season's games. Oh, wow. So you better go out and enjoy yourself and have a great time. Oh, But I would man. like to also, in the process, yes. give you my autobiography. Oh, thank we you. We met way back in Colorado. We did. You remember? I remember. She didn't think you'd remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was a story, and there was a story that happened all the way up to this point, so you'll have it. a chance to read everything about so it. So now here's the thing. Oh, don't great. go anywhere, so that way, you know, she can get her pictures and all that. I feel like we should do one more thing for Miss Powell. Powell, don't you think so? Oh, okay, so here's the deal. So here's the deal. I know it's kind of hard to top, okay. but we shared your story with Intrepid Travel, and they want to give Miss Pow Pow a $5,000 voucher wow. to go anywhere she wants in the world. Listen, let me tell you Thank guys about Miss Lachey Powell. She doesn't talk about it, but she oh, works two geez. jobs as a teacher. Yes. It's not always oh, easy. She's wow. here day in and day out, and I know you haven't given yourself any time for self-care. So with that $5,000, my friend, you can go anywhere in the world. Oh, my Thanks gosh. To travel. How much do we love Miss Powell Powell? Oh. <laughs> In behalf of teachers everywhere, uh, we talked about the fact that we know your mom is just smiling from heaven yes, this morning. Yes. Her mom was a spunky woman. She would come yes. to the classroom, help her decorate, help decorate for prom. Yes. What would you like to say? I would just like to say to teachers everywhere, keep doing what you're doing. You are changing lives. Every sleepless night, all that grading, all that feedback, everything you do, it's all worth it. it it's worth it. Congratulations. We appreciate you. Congratulations. New couple alert. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Sweet. Coming up, we're shining a light on a worthy cause that's making sure every kid starts the day with a healthy meal. Stay with us. We're back here on The Boost with a look at how impactful a healthy meal can be for students. The organization No Kid Hungry is on a mission to bring breakfast to the classroom. And we visited one school in California to see the difference it makes. It's the morning rush. Dropping off, playing, getting to class. Good morning, guys. Let's get in line. Hello. Ready? Here we go, kiddo. In most schools, the first bell starts the day. Class, class. Yes, yes. Waterfall. Perfect. But at Bing Wong Elementary School in San Bernardino, California, it means breakfast is served. That's because every morning starts with a meal in the classroom, a priority for school principal Dorothy McIntosh. 
it's the first meal of the day before our scholars can meet the cognitive demand that we are asking um, them to meet. The kids were quick to tell us how they feel without breakfast. I feel like my 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 stomach is growling a lot. I feel like grumpy and I want to be and I don't want to do stuff. No Kid Hungry helped the San Bernardino City Unified School District, which has 73 schools and more than 46,000 students, roll out the Breakfast in the Classroom program in four schools this year. The nonprofit estimates about 15% of children experience hunger in the county. Robin Hernandez manages the program here in California. There's a lot of barriers just to for kids getting breakfast. Sometimes transportation issues uh, arise or it's not always easy to get to that school breakfast. The school's food chain starts with Warren Ryan and his nutrition services team in the district. When we look at the difference in, in a traditional breakfast model, which is done in the cafeteria before the bell and breakfast in the classroom, is the biggest difference is kids have to choose, I'm going to eat or I'm going to play with my friends. And most kids will choose to play with their friends. Breakfast in the classroom for grades K through five adds up to some impressive math. About 600 meals a day, 3,000 meals a week, and more than 100,000 breakfasts for the year in just one school. I would foresee that we can see more than 3 million meals alone in breakfast. The assembly line starts early. Prepping, baking, and wrapping all the meal bags the kids pick up and distribute in class. I like the fruit. I say the donuts, the egg, and the biscuit. Warren says the breakfast team needed to win over skeptical teachers who were worried that the classroom meals would eat up lesson time or worse, make a mess. We work with every single site, every principal, and every teacher to make sure that they have what they need and they know that, that it's not supposed to be a burden, that we want to feed kids because it's our privilege. Principal McIntosh says so far, the program gets an A. We've noticed now less visits to the health office for stomach aches. We noticed that our scholars are much more ready right at the beginning of the day to get started learning. We have way less um, discipline concerns um, than we had before. I'm gonna come around and check on everybody. Breakfast also takes place during a period called social and emotional learning. It gives me energy to draw and do my work and stuff. When kids get to check in and talk before class. That gave us 122. Hmm, this is a hard one, guys. For students and teachers like Adam Bogarin, breakfast in the classroom fills both their hearts and their bellies. Now they want to be here. Uh, learning is going to take place, but before that, they're going to have a full tummy and be able to enjoy the day. Good things, Good things are going to come, are going to, come to me. To me. Moving on to another doggone good idea. It's a classroom where kids and dogs are learning side by side. And just wait until you see the results. Oh, yeah. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> That's what it started morning on. So it's not exactly your normal school greeting, but at Hanby Elementary in Wilmington, Delaware, it's just the way Brooke Hughes' first graders like it. I Hughes has always been an animal lover, and after fostering several puppies during the pandemic, a light bulb went off. What did the school say when you said, so I have an idea, I want to bring puppies to the classroom? Right, there was a lot of questions, um, but they said, after I kept telling all the research about how dogs and puppies, you know, can increase, you know, productivity and mental health, they said, all right, you get one day. That one day turned into the rest of the school year and the beginning of Foster Tales Puppy Therapy, a program Hughes created that she says has changed how her students learn. We've seen a benefit in their reading scores because if they have puppy time, if the puppies are asleep, they have to read to them. And so their reading confidence has soared. And the kids that were like, you know, hesitant to pick up a book and read, they couldn't wait to read to a puppy. These days, these first graders classmates include a pair of eight week old Husky pit bull mixes, Kelsey and Graham, fittingly a tribute to their favorite Philadelphia Eagles players, not far away. Hughes brings Kelsey and Graham home every night, but during the days, they've taught these kids to do more than just cuddle and play. The empathy with each other and the patience with each other, I've seen that being a huge growth since before we had puppies. Every morning they have to do a little check-in. How are you feeling today? This year, almost every day, 
they start really excited and I say, how are you feeling today? Like, I'm excited because I get to come to school with puppies and you. As a teacher, you can't ask for a lot more. I can't that. ask for it. I mean, if you, I think my number one job as a teacher in this grade is to make school fun, make learning fun. The rest will come. And it's coming quick. Just look at the poster Sydney made. Will you read it for me? Okay. Okay. Adopt a dog because they are playful and they like treats and they like naps. They do like naps. 20 puppies have now come through Hughes' classroom before finding their forever homes. Lincoln, why do we want these puppies to be adopted? So they can have a home. We want them to find a home forever, right? And this video she posted of her kids and the puppies bonding went viral with nearly 3 million views. People lost their TikTok minds. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea it was going to blow up. Why do you think it resonated? I think seeing the joy that the kids had and they fell in love with kids reading to them, of course. That puppy love has helped all of her students, including Logan, who is mostly nonverbal and uses this device to communicate. I like to read to Kelsey and Grant. He just came out of his shell. He came out of his shell, but he also taught us that he knows more than we knew. He was reading an above grade level book to the puppies. Wow. Hey, Good job. Good job. Woof. It's not just the kids that benefit, but the puppies too. If they weren't here, they would be in a cage most of the day at the shelter. And here they're being socialized. They're learning all kinds of different sights and sounds and smells. Socialization for the puppies. Oh yeah. Learning for the kids. Yep. I mean, who wouldn't want to learn like this? It's hard not to love adorable puppies. Oh. Right? Are you being adorable? Are you yeah, being adorable, of. Graham? Oh, whoa, Bumble! <laughs> Are you trying to go? Whoa, that was a French one. <laughs>
And they're putting their new skills to use. I gained 33,000 followers since I joined this class. Oh my goodness. I what about a, you all? I just had a TikTok hit 600,000 views. And you feel it's directly related to how you're doing in this class, what you're learning. Pay attention yeah. to details. What is trend jumping? Remind us real quick. The course is called Building Global Audiences, and the 35 students in it collectively have 5 million followers. But the professor, Dr. Aaron Dinan, believes it's less about going viral and more about building a platform. So is this course for someone who wants more TikTok followers? You can take the course if you want more TikTok followers, but that's not necessarily what I'm trying to get you there. A big part of what I'm trying to do in the course is help you understand that there is a business structure behind social media. Some of the students in there who are still college students, hundreds of thousands of followers. I mean, that's valuable, right? The core of the class is that audience is almost more important than everything else. If you can have the greatest product in the world, but if nobody knows about it, then it's useless, right? It doesn't matter. So you always need to start any sort of entrepreneurial endeavor thinking, well, how do I reach people? Which includes hopping on trends, like I did with Dinan. Bingo, you get to go to the airport tomorrow. Airport? I'm not going to the airport. Or targeting your content to perhaps fellow Duke students. Classrooms across the country are picking up on the trend, from Owens Community College in Ohio to East Carolina University, where viral video maker Mr. Beast is helping launch a new creator program. And at USC, Professor Robert Kozinets wrote an entire textbook on it. I think people might hear this story and think, a college class that teaches you how to get Instagram followers, is that really worth college credit? What would you say to that? You have to be thinking about this is a bigger phenomenon, something that's worthy of study by social scientists, not just a how to you know, hold your camera and take selfies. When you're an influencer, you're running your own business. You know, you are getting brand deals for yourself. You are shooting your own commercials. Essentially, you are editing them. Content creator Gigi Robinson, who never studied influencing in college, has over 140,000 followers on TikTok. She says learning these skills in school would have been a huge help. I think teaching influencer marketing and the creator economy in classrooms is really important because we need to teach the art of entrepreneurship. For these students of Dr. Dinan's class, they are ahead of the curve. Stick around for more fun stories right after the break. with one more uplifting story for you. Check it out. The anticipation was building, so a little baby in Spain had one ring left on her stacking rings toy. She could barely contain her excitement. Take a look. <laughs> Mission accomplished. The little things in life, don't they make life so sweet? Let's go. Very sweet. Thank you so much for joining us today here on The Boost. We hope we spark some joy for you today. And we will see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day.
You know, for a long time, I sort of suffered in silence. And this series is trying to shine a light on these topics. There is no stigma to me. It's mine. Welcome to our Today All Day Mind Matters special. You know, this month we're celebrating mental health awareness, a very important topic for everyone, but especially young people here in America. The youth mental health crisis is all too real. So we want to celebrate the people helping to fight it and normalize those conversations. Good example, musician M. Byhold. You may have heard her song, Numb Little Bug. It's her debut single. It's everywhere. It's about M's experience with antidepressants. The earworms blow up TikTok, prompting fans to share their their own mental health stories. Last year I had a song called Groundhog Day that was doing well on TikTok and all of a sudden like labels were reaching out and my dreams were coming true very quickly but at the same time I had started on antidepressants and I didn't realize that they could take the highs away as well as the lows and um, I had a conversation with my mom where I was like my dreams are coming true why am I not as happy as I expect to be and she was saying that sounds a little bit ungrateful and I was saying, it's not ungrateful, let me find the words for you, and then basically wrote Numb Little Bug. Do you ever get a little bit tired of life? Like you're not really happy, but you don't want to die. Like the viral TikTok launched singer-songwriter M. Byhold into stardom. Like your body's in the room, but you're not really there. Like you have empathy inside, but you don't really care. Like you're fresh out of love, but it's been in the air, I'm a past repair. In February, the single captured number one on Spotify's Global Viral 50 chart. And in April, Numb Little Bug landed M at the top of Billboard's Emerging Artist chart. Today, the song has been streamed nearly 250 million times. Do you remember the first time a fan came up to you and said, M, I heard your song Numb Little Bug, and it affected me in, what did they say? During the tour, um, I had a few people come up to me and tell me that like they had tried to commit suicide last year and had, you know, kind of recovered and, and found help, but also found my music. And that's the most meaningful thing I can get out of any of it. The fact that they like felt they had support through what I was writing. And those are probably honestly my favorite moments from tour. And I'm obviously, I'm so happy that they're still here and getting help. What is your history with mental health? Is there any from your childhood or when you look back on your, your young life, do things come to mind? Um, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety, but I also feel like a lot of people in this generation have it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. It's going anxiety on. society, sister. We're, we're part of it. Me too. <laughs> yes, sir. But it was getting to a point uh, during the pandemic where I was like, I had a mood tracker app and I had so many lows every day that I was like, I need to do something about this. And I had an appointment with a psychiatrist and within 15 minutes she prescribed the meds and I, I was kind of taken aback that it, you know, didn't take a longer conversation to, to do something as drastic as that, but I was willing to try. Did you think about other alternative ways to kind of deal with this as far as maybe going to therapy or whatnot? Um, I've talked to a few therapists and, and still haven't found the right person for me yet, but it is an active search. And I mean, I tried different versions of the medication and just decided that wasn't the route for me. But again, for some people it really is. It, I think it's just finding what's best for you and also making sure you talk to the people around you as well. And what role has music played in your mental health journey? Music has always been my form of therapy. It's just, it's the way that I process my emotions best. It's a flow state when I'm writing and there's nothing quite like it. I have it on good authority that at your concert last night, you actually have another song that's unreleased called One, Two, Three, Four, Five that also deals with the nature of mental health. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, I wrote one, two, three, four, five with a couple of friends of mine about panic attacks and using the, the counting to five method uh, to get over them. Because I've had my own experience, not to the worst extent of panic attacks, but you know, where you, you get like choked up and you can't breathe and the whole world yeah. kind of caves in on you a little bit. And no, well, I, I have this phrase that's like dance through your depression. Like I, I think we need to sort of band together and find positive ways to describe these really tough things that are going on. My generation has a history of, and, and others, of, of not discussing these issues. So we, we hide that. That's where that suffering in silence idea comes from, and the stigma on mental health. I mean, I love your bravery in, in the writing of the song and the recording of your personal feelings, how you do it with such courage, and you're so unabashed about it. And look, it's so relatable. Do you feel like your generation has a better time of discussing the topics of mental health? Oh, for sure. I mean, I remember 
I was making a video and I had a pill bottle in it and my parents were like, are you sure you want to show the pill bottle in this video? Because that's a sign of weakness. I mean, that's just what their generation grew up on and that makes sense. But I was like, we just talk about it and we laugh about it because that's the only way to get through, I mean, in, in my mind. So I have no shame <laughs> attached. Well, I love it. What did your family say about Numb Little Bug when they heard it? The whole thing? I think the first time they were like, wow, you're really, you're really saying all that. And I was like, yeah. Um, but I think as they've seen the response and the comments and the DMs and the people saying like, you know, after hearing this, I went to therapy or I talked to my family, I think they get it now. Access to mental health resources is another major hurdle for black and brown communities. And even just talking about the topic can still feel very taboo. So I spoke to one inspiring teacher in Los Angeles about the creative ways that he's bringing those desperately needed resources to his own community and students. Take a look. Whenever you decide to go to therapy, whatever you do, you want to know the questions to ask to find the right therapist for you. But a lot of times we don't know the questions to ask. It's the same thing finding your favorite restaurant, finding a pair of shoes that fit, you gotta try if you want. For BJ Williams, mental health is a calling. So BJ, your friends and family know you as the mental health guy, huh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm the mental health dude. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, man, you know what? I actually started when I started going to therapy for myself, and then I started doing this work that I'm doing now, and so yeah, that gave me the moniker of the mental health guy. My initial uh, intro into therapy was actual couples therapy with a girlfriend. In, in, during that time, my older brother died by suicide. And I left that relationship and a week later got into individual therapy. Your, your friends, like what did your friends think about you going to therapy? Did you tell them? Yeah, it was great. They were very supportive. And then I found out that some of them had gone before as kids or as teens. They just never spoke right. about it. And here I am, I'm like, yo, man, I gotta go to therapy today. And all of a sudden it was, yeah, B, I went to therapy before. And I was like, well, why, how come you didn't say anything to us about it? So it kind of just opened up the, the, the conversation within, within my network. Why do you think that? Why do you think people aren't forthcoming about going to therapy? There's a stigma behind it, specifically, uh, especially, not specifically, especially in, in black and brown communities, especially amongst men. And so it's one of those things that, that are, you know, stigmatized and that we are afraid to say because like, it's either you're crazy, you're on pills, or we write it off. But instead of writing it off, BJ kept the conversation going. As a teacher at Jefferson High School in South Central Los Angeles, he saw his students struggling with their mental health. There's nobody on this planet that doesn't have some form of struggle, right? But I'm in the underserved, you know, what would be considered a uh, poverty level community at a, at a high school that's one of the oldest high schools in LA. Um, and I know this, that the makeup of the, uh, of the school is mainly Hispanic Latina. We lack uh, resources here, you know, we lack school materials here. We lack a bunch of things. So he launched the Can I Be Vulnerable bus in March. Its first stop, Jefferson High School. So we provide the community with questions to go on the bus and interview a mental health professional. So that way, when they're ready to embark on their own journey, they at least have some knowledge on what questions to ask. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, black Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health issues, but are less likely to receive mental health help. And more than half of Hispanic young adults with serious mental illness may not receive treatment. There is still that family stigma that the kids themselves probably recognize that their parents or their guardians probably are still on the, the, the stigma of you can't be crazy. We can't afford to be crazy. That's for white people. We, you know, I mean, like we don't have access, that kind of thing. I'm reading your shirt, but tell me about that. Can I be vulnerable? What's the what's the history with that? Can I be vulnerable is my mental health platform. Uh, it started off as a uh, docu series. Actually, um, I recorded about 50 plus black men, and I let just them just talk about their mental and emotional health journey with a very personal story. Can I be vulnerable? Yes, you can. Will you be vulnerable? Well, you should. Um, we did that for like a year and a half, and then it kind of evolved into some other things. Um, we created a curriculum for high school students. What does Can I Be Vulnerable mean to you? <laughs> Funny. Uh, it's, it's, it's a question, and it's also a statement. So for me now, when I say Can I Be Vulnerable, I'm probably going to say something real. Like, I'm, I'm going to get emotional with you. I'm going to tell you something. I want to share me with you. So when I say, can I be vulnerable, that means listen up, because I'm about to, we're about to get into a conversation, something that I need to hear, or I want, to, I want you to know about me. How did the bus come about? I was thinking how to further do the work. And I was like, I don't, why don't you just taco truck this thing? Why don't you just bring the people? It was a very simple concept. 
How about I put mental health professionals on a bus and take them to the community like the ice cream man? And that's basically where it started. <laughs> I, it was nothing profound other than that. Right. I'm thinking of Eddie Murphy. Mom, throw down some money. <laughs> the ice cream man. Uh, yeah, here. like it was really just that. I was like, you know what? Mental treats for the for the kids, man. I think it's brilliant. That's really what it was. I was like, yeah, if I had a theme song, they know it's going to be mental health coming. When you were done with your event at Jefferson, did you hear back specifically from any students? What did they tell you? They liked it, one. <laughs> they felt it was needed, two. They would definitely go on a bus again, but more specifically, they do plan on going on a mental health journey. Um, having somebody that looks like them was really encouraging. They felt more at ease. There's an important part here about cultural competent care, right? I mean, that's at the essence of this. Yes, yes. And depending on what community we go to, I'll reach out to the mental health resources in that community so that they can do the work. I just have two office spaces on a bus. Um, but essentially, it could be resourcing where these social workers provide resources to the community on where they can get access to care, either free or you know sliding scale or provide something themselves. On the other end, it's uh, it's educational as well. Now, I didn't expect the kids to get on board to and just open up, but we also had you know mental health professionals that looked like them. I had a black man, I had a black woman, I had a Hispanic woman. They spoke the language, and I think that helped tremendously. Hey, do you think that the, like this this particular generation of young people that that you work with and talk to and know, do you think this is the generation that can really help destigmatize? the mental health issue in the black community. I truly believe that the next generation looking at us do this work and will continue on and will definitely do it. Since its launch, BJ's mental wellness bus has made more stops around Southern California and Las Vegas. BJ plans on keeping those conversations and his bus rolling. And that's the thing about it. If you build it, they will get there eventually. Because I've been noticing like, again, with my bus, people have been asking me, B, when are you coming here? When are you coming here? This is great, but I do think the future of it is bright. I do think this can be something that can go worldwide, honestly. That is a stud right there. That's BJ Williams. He's got big plans for that bus and that community. We appreciate his time and efforts out in California. Coming up next, we're going to check back in with Ohio State's Harry Miller. Welcome back to our Mind Matters Mental Health Special. Today we're focusing on the people who are pushing the conversation forward on young people and mental health. On the surface, college football player Harry Miller seemed to have it all, but the offensive lineman struggled with his mental health behind the scenes, opening up about his football retirement on the Today Show in March. Sadly, he's not alone in his mental health struggles. We caught up with Harry to talk about how he's doing and what needs to happen now when it comes to athletes and mental health. I don't think it can just be college football because there's been so many other athletes from different sports who have shared the same thoughts. So it's all within college athletics. In recent months, a series of high profile athletes across the US dying by suicide. Raising questions about what can be done to better help student athletes manage their mental health. I wish I had the foresight to 
diagnose what was going on. I think the worst part is when we don't talk about it. I've been in the sphere of seeing psychiatrists or mental health professionals since I was young, since I was eight years old or so. Um, but prior to the season last year, I was, in, I was in a pretty poor spot, and perhaps poor is an understatement. Harry's been on the football path since he was little. While it started off as just an after-school activity, he later found himself struggling under the pressure. I remember a coach one time during recruiting when I was a junior came up to me and talked about the NFL. I remember like in that moment, um, I don't know, you just feel sort of the, the weight of the hand you've been dealt. Some of those prophecies feel like death sentences. And you're like, there's no way out of this. Everybody thinks this is what I am. And I've got nowhere to go now. Last season, he hit his breaking point. So I, I spoke with my coach, Coach Day, our head coach at Ohio State, and um, was just honest and straightforward with him. I was depressed and anxious and I had suicidal thoughts. And um, over the course of what was the season, essentially, I was, I was receiving help for that. And I think back about how could I have been so sad and have felt so awful that I, that I would have wished not to be here. So he retired from football. Harry, in March, when you said that you're going to not play football for medical reasons and you got the courage and you actually did it, what did that feel like? Yeah, it felt awesome because um, it felt like taking a mask off. And prior to that, having to wear a mask, I gave up the stuff that was not for me to begin with. And because yeah. of that, I'm just extremely, I'm extremely grateful. And it's honest and it feels, and it feels great. When you were on the Today Show and you shared your story, what was it like when you like got off TV, like, what was the reaction to that? It was huge, a huge response. I had high schoolers talking about their experience. I had other college athletes talking about their experience. I had middle-aged men talking about how they wanted to take their own lives. I, I don't know, I don't know many issues um, that spread across every demographic like mental health does. Yeah. And it's our hearts, it's our souls, and it's and every single one of us. What does your mental health like toolkit look like? What works for you? Do you go to treatment? What do you do? I would say I have some some like logical backstops in my head now. I just think of all the people who love me. I think of my mother and my father, my brother, my girlfriend, and my friends. For me, it feels like I, I sort of hiked forward a few miles and got the layout of the land and. I'm hoping to just come back and say, like, you don't have to keep going this way. There's a better route than this. At Ohio State, Harry still trains with his teammates each morning, and the football staff has begun a suicide prevention training, which will equip them with the tools necessary for responding appropriately to someone in crisis. QPR, question, persuade, refer. It's a way to save lives. It's a way to give people hope. With the pressure of playing collegiate football lifted from his shoulders, Harry is focusing on his education. Someday, he wants to be a Rhodes Scholar. And he's enjoying his hobbies, from reading classic works of literature to playing guitar. If I'm sad, there's a sad song to play. And if I'm happy, there's a happy song to play. And um, I don't have to put it into words. And it's, it's, it's already there. For anybody who stumbles upon this and, um, and watches it and is struggling with their own demons, what do you say to somebody like that? There is nothing so absolute as as suicide and i remember i was talking to my friend um when i was in a bad a bad way and um he just said give it another day and um that became a sort of motto of ours to just give it another day what a great guy and such an inspiration 
appreciate Harry. Coming up next on Mind Matters, we're going to show you two different apps trying to help teens' mental health. So today on Mind Matters, we're shining a light on the people working to solve the youth mental health crisis and eliminate the stigma around discussing the topic. Now, part of that battle includes, of course, meeting young people where they are, where they frequently are. And where is that? Yeah, their phones. So we wanted to highlight two apps that are helping out. Every teen should have Teen Talk. After school, 16-year-old Lana Garrido logs into Teen Talk and gets to work. It's kind of an outreach app where, like, teens can use it as like a resource whenever like they're in a crisis or like they need someone to talk to. On the app, teens can anonymously post about what's bothering them, whether it's mental health or relationship problems or issues with friends. From there, Lana and hundreds of other teens work as teen advisors, trained to respond empathetically and offer resources and coping techniques peer to peer. Teen advisors receive 50 hours of training and are supported by licensed mental health professionals who can step in if a user is in crisis. 17-year-old Serena Guerrero has been a Teen Talk advisor since 2020. There's a shared understanding of what high school is like. There's a shared understanding of how friend groups can be. And that's something that I don't think that you can always get from an adult, no matter how much you trust them. The app is offered through the Jewish Big Brothers Big Sisters of Los Angeles organization. Teen Talk app was started four years ago in response to a growing need that we saw for teens to receive mental health support. And to date, we've reached over 40,000 teens in the last four years. At the start of the pandemic, the surging number of new users crashed the app, which had to be rebuilt to accommodate its new user base. We've also seen that for a lot of teens, just having a conversation with a peer about what they're going through can be a protective factor that allows them not to go down a path of more mental health challenges, more anxiety, more depression, that it actually prevents that. And that mental health support and validation can go both ways. What made me want to join Teen Talk was, it was a personal experience. Um, I struggled with an eating disorder myself. And I feel like through my journey with mental health, I kind of wanted to be that person I wish I had when I was struggling. I feel like I was able to relate with other kind of teens who are going through like similar things. Sometimes it's not even about eating disorders. It could be something about like body dysmorphia or like kind of body related issues. And I feel like that definitely kind of helped me heal from that experience. So one of the lessons that we go over in training and in our continued education classes are dealing with people who struggle to come out as part of the LGBTQ community. The way Teen Talk was just able to make 
that feels so normal. It really empowered me to come out to um, friends and family. Um, and I, I didn't know at the time how much hiding that part of hiding that part of myself um, was affecting me until I was able to come out. The app wants to break multiple stigmas around getting mental health help and show that sometimes being on your phone is a good thing. The reality is that teens have a smartphone, they're on their phone, and they're on social media. And we want to make sure that Teen Talk app is what they're accessing because it's safe and it's really a good resource for them. Social media does have a bad reputation and I see it on our app. I see teens coming to us about being very insecure about the way they look because they see all these photoshopped models on Instagram, TikTok. However, Teen Talk, you don't see anyone. There's no talk about what makeup brands to use. On the app, you come on and you see other teens posting about things that they're struggling with. That urge to strip away all the gloss and Photoshop on our feeds, powering another app called Be Real. Once a day, at a random time, users get a notification that simply says, time to be real. At that moment, you've got two minutes to snap a pic. Your phone's front camera captures what you're doing, no matter how mundane while the rear-facing camera captures a selfie of you. It's really like just a snippet in someone's life. It's just a snapshot. Maybe I just got out of the shower or like I'm in the middle of working out or something. You know, nobody's photo is gonna be of them in like full glam, you know, like looking their best. I think it's sort of an unspoken rule that we're all gonna do it and be, you know, our just like natural selves. Even though the app launched in early 2020, it really skyrocketed this year growing 315% since January 1st, according to Aptopia. For college sophomore Juliana Coffarella, she says it's a way to share a more real part of her life with close friends, like when she got a notification during her aunt's funeral. So I like quickly snapped just like a picture of like just my eyes up um, and they were like really puffy from crying at a funeral. But you know, those are things that are like slightly more vulnerable moments. Be Real is marketed as an alternative to addictive social networks. It won't make you famous, the company bluntly states. If you want to become an influencer, you can stay on TikTok and Instagram. It's definitely not as draining on your mental health. You know, it's not these like curated images from celebrities or influencers or anything. Like it's really just your friends um, that, you know, you're not getting that sort of outside pressure to be something that you're not. Two apps trying to foster better mental health for teens. Hopefully both of those great apps will inspire more just like them. That's going to do it for our Mind Matters special. We certainly hope that these stories inspire you to please keep the conversation going with your loved ones. To find trusted mental health resources, that's a hard thing to do. If you're looking for those resources near you, we encourage you to visit Project Healthy Minds. I'm on the board. They're doing some great work, and they can help you hook up with those resources. You can find more information at today.com slash mindmatters. We appreciate your time today. Thanks so much.
new evidence this morning that the so-called Mediterranean diet, it can sharply reduce your chances of developing dementia even if you have a genetic risk for it. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar here, is here to tell us about the new study and that could have us eating healthier. What encouraging news. Yeah. I mean, what, anything can fight back against dementia and Alzheimer's, but this is a diet that a lot of people have been on or are on. Absolutely, Hoda. It is definitely another vote for the Mediterranean diet. So this study looked at over 60,000 individuals who were middle-aged um, and followed them for about nine years. Ooh. And there were close to 900 cases of dementia. People who followed strictly a Mediterranean diet had almost a quarter lower chance of developing dementia. And as you said in the lead, they actually took into account genetic risk, and that didn't even make a difference, which is really, really encouraging because you think that certain things are predetermined, mm -hmm. but this is the kind of thing that we can all actually implement in our lives. Can you remind everybody what the Mediterranean yeah. Yeah. diet is and, and then why it might have affected something to do with your brain health? Right. So, so the Mediterranean diet, think plant-based. Okay, Ooh. so we're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, seeds, legumes, things like that, fish, seafood, olive oil. You want to limit or eat in moderation red meat, eggs, poultry, cheese, yogurt, and sweets. Why is it? Well, you know, some people have said maybe it's not a direct effect on the brain, but maybe because it's reducing inflammation, it's, it wow. has antioxidants, that it's helping your heart health, that helps the blood vessels in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know exactly why, but nonetheless, this is very compelling. It was such a large study. Besides the, the change of diet, are there yes. ways that, that folks might be able to reduce the likelihood that they develop Alzheimer's or, or dementia? Absolutely. And all of these things, again, are lifestyle changes, getting adequate sleep, controlling your blood mm -hmm. pressure, controlling cholesterol your blood glucose, staying physically and mentally active. These are all things that can help with cognitive decline and hopefully stave off oh. risk of dementia. Okay, Thanks. thank Thanks. you, Dr. Thanks. Natalie. Diet can play a big part in our ability to stay sharp and may even reduce your risk of cognitive diseases such as Alzheimer's. Here's a look at how the foods we choose can impact our ability to focus and function. We have all felt that dreaded mid-afternoon slump and it turns out there's a reason for it. What's happening in the brain when you feel this slump is it doesn't have the fuel it needs. The fuel that you're providing all have an impact on whether or not your brain will be as sharp as it humanly can be. That fuel comes in the form of food. 20% of the calories you consume go toward brain function, which needs specific nutrients to focus and function fully throughout the day. What goes into our bodies is almost certainly going to reflect itself in our brains. We're in an era now where we can get all kinds of processed, packaged foods that aren't necessarily what our bodies have evolved to deal with. To keep our health maximal, what you want to do is eat naturally. Research shows that people who eat a primarily plant-based diet are more likely to experience brain-boosting benefits both short-term and long-term. The clearest evidence of benefit and risk reduction revolves around the MIND diet and the Mediterranean diet, which have both been studied quite well and show good effects. MIND diet stands for Mediterranean Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's broken down into a list of healthy foods like leafy greens, beans, nuts, whole grains, fatty fish, having about two servings of berries every day actually help to reduce cognitive decline by about two and a half years. Of course, there are foods to limit too. Things you want to avoid are going to be anything that is high in sugar, refined carbohydrates, so white pasta, white bread, obviously any sugary drinks. You want to limit the amount of overall saturated fat that's coming into your diet, typically coming from meats, animal products such as high fat dairy, things of that nature. 75% of the brain is made up of water, so what you drink is important too. Many times when people say they feel drained of energy or they're hungry, they're just dehydrated. Water is really critical as a drink. Coffee is great. Any kind of tea will have benefit. In the short term, there's no doubt that caffeine improves processing speed and helps with attention. A lifetime habit of caffeinated beverages may be protective against brain disorders later. Psychologically, people see the effects of a diet shift pretty rapidly. They start feeling better, they start having more energy, and this cascades into all sorts of other things in life, like how happy you are and how well you're sleeping at night. So when people shift their diets so that they're eating well, 
it really matters. A brain healthy diet may also help prevent cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's, which is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. 64 year old Debbie Morden has a history of Alzheimer's in her family. My father had Alzheimer's for 12 years. His brother had Alzheimer's and three of his first cousins had Alzheimer's. Debbie has tested positive for an Alzheimer's gene and is taking a proactive approach. She's seen an Alzheimer's prevention specialist who recommended the MIND diet. That gene means I have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. I went on basically a vegan diet except for fish. I've cut out dairy and I'm eating more grains and more legumes, increasing olive oil and a daily intake of berries, and also lowered alcohol to four ounces of red wine a couple times a week. After eight months, Debbie has significantly lowered her cholesterol and hopes her new diet will ward off cognitive deterioration. I watched my father for 12 years decline. The whole thing with, with Alzheimer's, it starts developing 10 to 20 years before you see signs of it. So you want to start preventing it as early as possible. I'm making the changes because I want to live a healthy life as long as I can and enjoy it. Whether you're 85 or you're eight, now is the time to start building that base. Diet can prevent certain things. And I never want to have a conversation with my patient where they've developed something and we didn't have the years to work into that prevention factor. It's something you have to commit to and do it for the long haul. We always say we want a brain span to match your lifespan. For more on the Mind Diet, head to hodaandjenna.com. with more is the author of This Is Your Brain on Food, Dr. Uma Naidu. Welcome, Dr. Naidu. Hi, Dr. Naidu. Uh, thank you so much, Jenna and Hoda. I'm a big fan, so oh. I'm excited to be here. That thank is so you. sweet. Okay, you know what? I, I sort of like know in theory how this works because I know when I eat terrible food the night before, I wake up the next day and I feel even worse. And my goal in eating that terrible food is to soothe myself mm -hmm. at night. For eating. So there's a real direct correlation between your gut and your brain. Exactly. You know, Hoda, you'd be surprised to know that some people call the gut the second brain. Mm. And here's why. They have a profound influence on one another, and they actually have the same origin in the body. So I think that's something useful for people to know when they, you know, when they make a decision about what to eat. Mm. Okay. So w we wake up in the morning. Sometimes we have those days where we're feeling sluggish, yeah. we're not motivated. Yeah. And I've noticed that if I eat certain things... I feel yeah. worse. Yeah. So, but what can we eat to make us start our day on the right path? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because I think we're all feeling a little bit th of that these days. I like to add spices. So, you know, you could add things like black pepper, cinnamon, and ginger, which are actually ingredients of my grandmother's chai tea recipe, but mm. they're great to kind of liven things up. Also things like saffron, which can be added. It's a great aromatic. It can be added to a risotto or adding, you know, things like rosemary and sage to a roasted 
to roasted veggies can help liven things up for you. And maybe you, because what you're trying to do is feel more alert and um, you know feel feel more energy as well. What would you say is a, like the best breakfast if you want to ha- start the day mm-hmm. right? So I actually love uh, either something like a chia pudding or, you know, chia pudding, a little bit of coconut milk and topped with um, lots of different nuts. My favorite go-to nuts that are great brain foods are either hazelnuts or macadamia. And, you know, a simple thing like that that you can even make ahead is Mm -hmm. a great way to, you know, you can plan for the week, uh, set out your little chia puddings and you have them ready to go. So we have been talking all morning about how people are more anxious than ever. Mm -hmm. What are some foods that can actually help soothe anxiety? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think the uncertainty is what's so difficult for people, and this is where fiber is your friend. Mm. Um, So adding in fiber-rich foods that you get from, you know, vegetables, um, certain berries, uh, beans, nuts, seeds, and legumes, those help to sort of even out your your blood sugar levels because they break down more slowly in the body. But it's also important to know things to avoid when you're feeling anxious. And what I like to remind people about here is that there's sometimes hidden sources of caffeine that we don't think about, um, such as, you know, sodas that have caffeine or other beverages, and then things like, um, you know, chocolate could have caffeine. And Mm -hmm. um, some over-the-counter headache pills as well. Mm -hmm. So you you want to try to avoid these if you're feeling super anxious and you're feeling stressed. What if you're feeling just down? You don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a funk or whatever. And usually in those yeah. moments, that's when you go for the comfort yes, food that like really sweets. take you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's a long rabbit hole. So so I, I like to suggest things that people can do right now. You know, adding prebiotic or probiotic rich foods, which are fermented foods, um, into your diet even right now can really help you and start to make a difference. Um, but, you know, I also think the same thing with depression. Hold on, Jenna. I think that also knowing things to avoid becomes super important. And here's where I want people to know that there are actually a lot of studies that show that sugar is associated quite profoundly with levels of depression. Mm. And um, things like, you know, nitrates, which you find in processed meats, um, are also uh, linked to depression. So maybe cut back on those foods and add back, you know, prebiotic rich foods and probiotics, which are usually fermented foods, like Like a fear, unsweetened, and things like that. Like what, what were the pre or probiotic foods that are, we can try? So prebiotic foods are like garlic, leeks, onions, um, you know, it's different types of vegetables. And these feed the good bugs in your gut and help and really help you stave off symptoms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then probiotics are usually, usually a supplement, but fermented foods um, are rich in these active cultures and things like miso, kimchi, unsweetened kefir, sauerkraut, um, kombucha mm. are all good options for you. Oh, so okay. I think a lot of people are having a hard time sleeping. Mm-hmm. Some I, I used to drink chamomile tea before mm-hmm. bed. Let's talk about things that are good for sleep and then mm-hmm. the benefits of chamomile tea. Absolutely. So chamomile, you know, the great aroma really helps us to de-stress and it's well known. I also have another tip about de-stressing, which is turmeric with black pepper, a pinch of black pepper. And you can add it to a soup or smoothie. And why turmeric with a pinch of black pepper? It hits the high notes on so many conditions in mental wellness. So that's that's one of my go-tos. Great. Okay. Dr. Naidu, thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate you. Okay, are you ready to feel your best yet? If the answer is yes, we've got some power foods to tell you about that can improve your overall health and wellness. We're talking about immunity, sleep, brain health, all the things max. Lugavir is a health and science journalist. His recent book is called Genius Genius Kitchen. Kitchen. First of all, I love the fact that the things we need are right in front of us, right in the fridge, right in the supermarket that can actually help us physically. We're always taking pills if we have a problem. We're not working the front end. Food is medicine. It's such a a cool way to think about life, right? It is. I mean, yeah, food is so powerful. I mean, with, with every bite you take, you are essentially either feeding or fighting disease. And so I'm here to present some of what I think are the most powerful foods available to most most people in your average okay. supermarket. Okay. Mushrooms, yeah. they're all over the place. Yeah, so mushrooms can actually be used to balance immune function, to foster better immunity. Wow. So there are a few mechanisms here which are, are okay. still being elucidated, yeah. but essentially some mushrooms create vitamin D, which can tamper down an overactive immune response. Mm-hmm. But I think most interestingly, mushrooms I like lion's mushrooms. mane, which are typically pretty available, they actually create antioxidants that we produce in our own bodies, one of which is called glutathione. It's uh-huh. considered the mother of all antioxidants. It helps to detox. Mm. And and reduce What's, oxidative which stress. Which one's lion's mane? This one? 
So that's oyster, right? Yeah. So oh, we have. Is we that have, lion's mane? That's not a lion's mane. No, yeah. lion's mane actually has like a. It has the consistency of crab, fresh crab. It's oh. really. By really the way, tasty. whatever this one is, it's really good. I want to keep eating. Here's it. a tip. Actually, you don't want to rinse mushrooms. You just want to. You just oh, want eat to them a little dirty. dirty. Cook them. Yeah, eat them a little dirty with some nice uh, okay. butter or olive okay. oil. Okay. Move on to kiwi. kiwi. So here we've got kiwi. Kiwi can be used to promote better digestion and good sleep. So we're seeing clinical trials Ooh, now wow. that two kiwi a day. Yeah, actually, in a head-to-head -head match against psyllium husk. <laughs> Kiwi has been shown to, to help uh, reduce constipation, which a lot oh. of people suffer from. And also, <laughs> yeah, can, can help fight constipation and also improve sleep, too, before Should bed. Should you skin on or off? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Eat the kiwi with the skin what? because skin the skin on. contains Skin's more good. vitamin E. Uh, take and, I've never yeah. eaten a kiwi with skin. Yeah, it's Try good. It. People think that it's weird, but it's, it's actually bad. really tart and delicious. Mm -hmm. You like it's it? It's not bad. You're I don't know bad. that I could force my kids to eat. Wow, it's tart. It's is good, tart. right? But it balances out the okay. sweet. But what, it, what if the kid done eat it? Is it okay, the middle stuff? Yeah, yeah. the middle is great, too. The middle is great, okay. too. Okay, let's get to these fruits. Okay, so here we have brain foods. So these foods are loaded with compounds called plum. flavonoids, which are plant pigments that are usually in the outer skin. We've got apples, we've got citrus, we've got plums. Berries are a great mm. source of flavonoids. They've been shown to boost BDNF in the blood, which is a, a miracle grow protein that actually helps to support healthy neurons. BDNF, it's BDNF, called? BDNF, yeah. Okay. We produce it in our muscles when we work out. One of the reasons why exercise is so great, but this has actually been shown to boost it. So you never know. An apple a day might keep the neurologist doesn't, away. Doesn't matter red or green, whatever? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. High right. flavonoid foods. Okay, right. let's there go to go. strawberries mm. and almonds. Yeah, so these are anti-aging foods. Strawberries are rich in a compound called fisetin, which is known as a senolytic. So we have in our bodies, all of us, especially as we age, uh, cells called senescent cells okay. that secrete pro-inflammatory compounds that can make, make our skin look uh, more aged. And so these actually fight aging by helping to kill off those <laughs> zombie cells. Yeah. You can actually no, eat. thank you, zombie skulls. Mm. And actually, this is actually also very interesting. Strawberry leaves are rich in caffeic acid, which is a very powerful antioxidant. So eat the leaves? So when you yeah, eat you a eat strawberry, you eat the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, I do. And almonds are loaded with magnesium, which 50% of Americans don't consume adequate uh, amounts of. And magnesium can help fight DNA damage. Wow, oh, this so, is crazy. Again, yeah. Okay, hit us with the last one. Okay, so here we've got dark chocolate and coffee. So this, I mean, people are probably at home rejoicing. If I am. Loaded with compounds called flavanols. When you buy dark chocolate, you want to make sure that the cacao percentage is high. And it's not, it hasn't been processed with alkali, also known as Dutch processed, which greatly degrades oh. the health quality of the uh, chocolate. And then from, a, uh, from the standpoint of coffee, coffee's long been associated with better cardiovascular yeah. health, reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. And we now know that, there, that caffeine actually can help promote better lipids in the blood, so better, like, uh, healthier cholesterol levels. Wow.
Welcome back. It is Super Food Friday. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is back, and this week she has not one, not two, but three surprising superfoods that could help boost brain power and enhance your memory. This is exciting. First of all, the role that food plays in terms of our, our memory, in terms of our brain health and all that. Which is a great question. So there's a lot of studies that we have now that are showing that there are certain compounds within foods and beverages okay. that can help to slow cognitive decline and also boost memory, boost brain power it's all good and I'm gonna feature three today let's start with the blueberries blueberries you can tell from their color they are packed with antioxidants and in fact that they rank number one when the USDA did like a huge rally of all of the fruits and vegetables number one, number okay. one. Yeah. and they get their blue color from something called anthocyanins that's the name of the antioxidant and we know that that helps to boost brain power there's actually even a Harvard study that shows if w these women they ate one cup a week that's not a lot mm -hmm. and they had significant increase in their smarts they did all sorts of tests and stuff how easy is that oh, right yeah. you could throw them in pancake batter and muffin yeah. batter on your oatmeal but this is my favorite way classic peanut butter and jelly sandwich swap out the sugary jam oh, and just put whole blueberries and this is so fun out. for your kids huh. no they stick because of the peanut butter mm -hmm. and then um, for kids you can make a tic-tac-toe board oh, this is like the ultimate pre-exam morning breakfast I love that. <laughs> that's a great idea so cocoa powder is the next superfood cocoa powder is like the king of dark chocolate because it's a hundred percent dark chocolate mm -hmm. and they contain something called flavanols it's another type of antioxidant that we know can keep your blood vessels healthy and elastic, which means a healthy heart. And a healthy heart equals a healthy brain, because when your blood vessels are open and elastic and healthy and happy, all of the nutrition goes right up to your brain. You get more oxygen, you get more nutrients. So what I'm gonna show you that you can do is add, it's not sweet, cocoa powder is not sweet and indulgent like dark chocolate, but you could do a lot of things with it. Okay. If you take some and you mix it into, this is just a vanilla low-fat yogurt. Yogurt. Mm -hmm. Two ingredients, and you've Perhaps now some. made a brain boosting chocolate pudding. So, my kids oh. will just think they're having chocolate pudding, just and really. Tell them it's chocolate pudding. Really? Oh, wow. Mm. Isn't that good? Two like ingredients. Now this Doesn't get easier than that. This is the most right. surprising superfood to me. Work. Coffee? Coffee. Al, every single week we are hearing more and more studies showing that yeah. the benefits in terms of brain health for coffee. We used to think it was just the caffeine. We know yeah. that caffeine keeps you alert, it wakes you up, mm -hmm. but it's a combination of the caffeine and the antioxidants within coffee uh. that could help boost brain power. And that's really good news because a lot of people are caffeine sensitive. Mm -hmm. So that means decaf gives you these health perks as well. And all you need is about a half a cup to four cups a day to reap these benefits. So Even you're making a, a breakfast co uh, cookie. I I developed. I'm calling this You're my so excited exclusive. About these. I'm so excited about these cookies. These are brain boosting breakfast coffee cookies. This is exclusive to okay. the Today Show. Just to the Today yeah. Show. I'm going to put right. them on Instagram and I'm going to put them on our website. So for the dry ingredients, it's um, whole grain flour. We have cocoa powder, some mm. cinnamon, and we have a little bit of uh, baking powder and some salt and some salt, kosher salt. Now I'm adding instant coffee, oh. boom, oh. right into the batter. We're gonna so mix. I thought that was connected to this, but no, this is just instant coffee. This is just instant okay. coffee. You could also use finely powdered regular coffee mm -hmm. as well, but it's easy to buy the instant. So okay. Yeah, What's so the wet ingredients are a lot of usual breakfast foods. I have Greek yogurt, I have eggs, I have mashed banana, and a little bit of honey. You mix oh, these two okay. things in, then you fold in your blueberries, because oh, all three superfoods are in here. That's Go amazing. taste a cookie. See what you think. Right. Wait, wait, wait. And then a little bit of chocolate there. chips. Each cookie is only 80 oh, wow. calories and comes packed with protein and fiber. So you could have three with a cup of coffee for oh, breakfast. Wow. Fantastic. Wait, Joy, thank three you cookies? so much. Three cookies for breakfast. For these recipes, go to today.com health, and we'll be right back. Cheers. Oh, oh my goodness.
we're going to tell you about five foods to add to your diet to help improve memory, energy levels, and sleep. Dr. Taz Batia is an integrative wellness physician and host of the Superwoman Wellness Podcast. But this is for everybody. Dr. Yes. Taz, good morning. Good morning. So you're saying before we get to it that, that if you start incorporating these into your diet, you'll see results relatively quickly? The beauty about kind of getting your diet right is usually within three weeks, oh. you can see a change. And it can be as quiet as you have more sleep and you have more energy to like you're on and you're focused and ready to go. Wow. What is it about these foods that we're going to look at here? What is it about these particular foods and, and other items that give the brain that boost? Well, what, why we have picked these foods is because we call them superfoods. They just have a ton of nutrients for every serving. Okay. So they're su they're efficient, right? So if you're trying to get these nutrients in, this is an efficient way to do it to keep your brain and your energy superpowered. All right. Our first super ingredient is yes. magnesium. Where do we find that? So magnesium, I always call the miracle micronutrient. It helps us with sleep. It helps calm us down. It helps balance serotonin. Try that. It's Believe so it or not, dark chocolate is going to be oh, one of our best sources. An ounce of it has about 64 milligrams of magnesium okay. in it. Legumes are great. They come in at about 70 milligrams. A tablespoon of flax, which you see right here, mm -hmm. at about 40. Avocado also has magnesium, but less than the dark chocolate. So you, so you have this recipe, these little balls. What are in those then? So it's a lot of cacao, which has a lot of the magnesium mm -hmm. and the antioxidants in it. Almond butter for the healthy fats, flax seeds. Mm -hmm. Mix it up together. Super easy. Has a little bit of oat too. A little dark chocolate. A little in there. dark chocolate in there. So it's yummy, yummy, right? Yeah. yeah. And not too much calories. No, not too many it? calories. No. So we have a chocolate many craving. Calories. You go for Let's it. Let's talk collagen here because yes. collagen, you say, is it's actually naturally occurring in our bodies. We all have it. We've all got collagen. It's naturally occurring. We know it for skin and health, hair and overall health. But it actually helps support the gut lining, helping us to absorb the nutrients. So many people are eating healthy, but they're not absorbing what they're eating. Collagen comes in and helps us with that, helps the brain, helps energy. It's in a lot of naturally occurring proteins. So we've got salmon here, for example, and chicken. You know, these are things that are a great way to get salmon in. This looks like chicken this stock. Is, How would you use it? This is bone broth. Bone so broth. Some people oh. will just drink bro bone broth and get a great Roker, source of collagen. Try a smig. Roker does Wash that, that out. And then if, you're, if you're vegetarian, you can get some collagen from your vegetables as well. It's just that we get a lot more through our proteins and through our bone broth. Okay. Uh, uh, these are cruciferous. Those are can cruciferous. you only get the collagen from cruciferous? Not vegetables? necessarily. Okay. No, yeah. you can get it from other vegetables as well. It's just not as dense. All right, this is a new one on me. Choline. What is that? Why is it good? So choline, I feel like, doesn't get enough press, and I'm so glad we're talking about it today. So choline actually is a nutrient that comes in and coats all our nerves. So it helps us with learning, Never with memory, that. with hmm. focus. And we really want to get choline in our diet. So choline is naturally found in eggs. Eggs are one of the best sources. Huh but you've got to eat the egg yolk. Okay. The yolk has the choline, has about 140 milligrams. We've got mushrooms and burgers here. Which one do you think has more choline? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. You guys win. Good okay. job. So mushrooms actually have more choline How than many a eggs would you have to eat or mushrooms? Like what's a serving to get enough choline so any given day? So just, this is the beauty of eggs. One full egg, including oh. the yolk, will okay. do it. You need a cup of mushrooms. You actually need two burgers to get the choline. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I love choline. Mushroom. Yeah. Mushrooms and eggs, I guess. There yeah. we go. This, yes. this is something I've never heard of. Oh, ghee. I've heard of this. I've it's like butter or something? Ghee is uh, it's like butter. That's a great way to think about it. It's clarified butter. It's been used in Eastern systems of medicine for a really long time. And it's been used as a healing fat. Mm. And the reason is, is because ghee actually has less lactose, less casein. So if you've got somebody that's dairy intolerant, yeah. can't tolerate that stuff, they can usually tolerate ghee very well. But the secret superfood ingredient here is MCT, or medium chain triglycerides. That helps the brain. It helps the gut. It balances everything everything living down here in the mm. gut. And that is really the powerhouse, the source of our energy. So if we're not getting some of these healthy fats in, that's one of the biggest reasons I see brain and energy start to go down. How do you get ghee in your diet? I'm not looking to yes, take a big old no, bite we don't want you, we, And we don't want you, you to do that. you put it on toast? You can put it on toast. Literally, all you need is about a quarter to a oh, half wait, of a sure teaspoon. They that. A tiny little bit. A tiny little teaspoon. You don't need okay. a lot. And you can spread it on something. You, it also has a higher smoke point, so you can bake and fry with it oh, as well. Okay. So you can use it as as butter. Exactly. Welcome to The Boost. On today's show, we'll meet the stars behind a few viral TikTok videos, but let's get things started. We're going to take a look at a special club that's all about food, friendship, and paying it forward.
It's better to give than to receive. That's what my mother taught me. The feeling you get is indescribable. Richard Brooks loves to dine in surprise with a group of friends who call themselves the Thousand Dollar Breakfast Club. The goal of the club is to make a server very happy with at least a thousand dollar tip. Currently a lawyer, Richard knows the difference a big tip can make. When I was in college, I was a waiter. My biggest tip ever was $20, and I remember it. I remember the person giving it to me. I remember the feeling I got. I don't know why they gave it to me. Maybe they just thought that I was a hardworking kid going to college. He would continue sharing that feeling by giving service workers $100 here and there. But it was his brother who inspired Richard earlier this year to take it to the next level. My brother called me from California and said, hey Richard, guess what I just did, what? I just went to this breakfast where everybody gives a $100 bill and they give the waiter or waitress a $1,000 tip. So he knew I would do it and by that night I had gotten 10 friends together and we started the club. After their first surprise in March. Well, this tip is for you, $1,400. Wow. The friends met every couple of months at various restaurants around Massachusetts. My favorite one so far was the server who said, with a big smile on his face, my mother's been trying to buy a hearing aid for herself, so I'm going to go home today and buy her a hearing aid. And he did. The members of the club get as much from this as the restaurant workers do. It's nice to be able to do something like this and uh, just try and pay it forward. The way the world has been the last couple of years, the world needs more of this. So it's an honor to do this. My late son, Christopher, was in the business for many, many years, and I saw how hard he worked. So this breakfast club, it just warms my heart to see the reaction on the faces of those that are receiving this money. We really want this to spread and we want others around the country to understand that you don't have to be a celebrity or a millionaire to do something special to really make somebody's day. I'm a teacher, we just want people around the world to realize you can do this. Now that club is gaining attention and motivating others to do the same. <laughs> We got the chance to join the Thousand Dollar Breakfast Club as they head to Red's Kitchen and Tavern in Peabody, where Mimi Joyce has no idea what's in store for her. Hi everyone, I'm Mimi. I'm gonna be your server. Are you all set to order? Would you like a little more coffee? After settling the bill, it's time for the big surprise. The only reason we're here is for you. Every single person in this room has given a hundred dollar tip. So oh my goodness. We have a big tip for you. This Thank is the you, fun Thank you everybody. Part. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, one, two. Oh my gosh, 13, oh my god. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900 Thank you so much Thank everybody. you so much. Thank you. We get wow. just as much pleasure as you do, believe it. It's so fun to I'm us. so happy right now. I feel like I just won a million bucks, really. Thank you oh, so a much. A single mom who's been working in restaurants for nearly 25 years. This experience, priceless. I plan to use this tip by paying off some bills and making sure my kids have everything that they ask for. And also to pay it forward by giving a nice tip to my servers. <laughs> My heart feels happy right now. I, I just feel like that was just so generous, and I feel really overwhelmed with gratitude. Can I give you a hug? Oh, you can give me a hug, of course. Thank you so Enjoy much. It. Now let's turn to complete strangers coming together and having kind conversations, all in the hopes of bridging a divide. Meet the founder of One Small Step. I am nervous. I am excited. I am coming into this with an open heart and an open mind. I am very excited to see how this turns out, what we have in common, and what differences we have and how that can still unite us. In Wichita, Kansas, strangers Lamisha Courtney and Brandi Hibbs are about to meet for the first time. This scheduled coming together of strangers is all part of the nonprofit One Small Step, which hosts and records 50 minute conversations between people with different political views. Prior to the conversation, Misha and Brandy were given each other's bios. I know she's a single mom, has three children. She is um, from a family of six, that she has children of her own, that her father was in the military. One Small Step founder Dave Isay is on a crusade to unify our country, one conversation at a time. You know, if we spent more time listening to each other and less time screaming at each other and hating each other, what a better and stronger country it would be. 
One Small Step uses contact theory psychology under the premise that it's hard to hate up close. Part of the secret sauce of One Small Step is that we don't talk about politics. This is just about two human beings looking each other in the eye and talking about what really matters to them. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> A facilitator handed them their first question. So Brandy, tell me about one or two people in your life who have had the biggest influence on you. A place they found common ground. I have to say my parents, hands down. They had me when they were super young. Um, and we're not prepared to be parents. I would say the exact same. Um, my parents were and still are some of the most important people to me. So when you were talking about your parents, like I was like, oh gosh, that's me too. They soon discovered differences on some hot button issues. I'm definitely more on the conservative side. I am very pro-life. My faith as being a Christian, definitely something that has molded me to who I am, but also shaped my beliefs. Certain segments of population say pro-life, but don't want to have gun laws in place that stop the lives of innocent children in schools being killed. Personally, you know, being an open carrier myself, um, I prefer that. I'd rather see it and know who's got it, but I still think there should be training that's involved um, in the handling of the weapons and the safety of the weapons and things like that. Misha shared her biggest for, fears as a mother. People talk about Black Lives Matter and, oh, we don't like them because they start. No, what we're trying to say is that we want our lives to matter just as much as anybody else's lives. I don't want to have to worry about my children walking the street in my neighborhood and never coming home. I worry when they go to the snow cone stand with their friends that don't look like them. And I just wish we lived in a world where I didn't have to worry about that. I wish I had the words to respond because honestly, um, and it's it's something that you know I've I've thought about, but I I don't understand it. If there's something I can do to increase my knowledge and learn more about your perspective, then I'm all for it. In the end, they found some common ground. Your desire to want to know more or saying, what can I do? That's the first step. Sure. Just, okay, being willing to, okay, I don't understand. How can I understand or what can I, who can I talk to, what can I learn? And so even a new that. friendship. <laughs> so I've found a, a friend um, with Misha um, and, and I'd love to be able to keep in touch. So I didn't come looking for a friend, but I think I found one. Every interview ends the same way. It almost belies belief. You know, it decreases fear of the other and, and it allows us to see the human being and the American sitting across from us. Coming up, a remarkable woman fighting ALS with a lot of humor and heart right after this. Here on the boost with a story about a remarkable young woman who's finding light in the darkness. Diagnosed with ALS, she is determined to show the world what it's really like to live with an incurable disease. And she's doing it with heart, humor, 
and Amazing Grace. If you had to describe 34-year-old Brooke Eby's love language, it would probably be laughter. Brooke, you are the most cheerful person I can imagine who has such a serious diagnosis. What gives you that joie de vivre, this joy? <sighs> Levity is my superpower, and it's really how I'm bringing my story to the world. I'm trying to use humor and really let ALS be heard. At the young age of 29, Brooke began experiencing weakness in her legs. It took doctors three years to diagnose her with ALS, a rapidly progressing neurodegenerative disease. It's a devastating diagnosis and there are no survivors. Thank you. Today we're seeing my neurologist. It's not really an appointment I think any ALS patient looks forward to, mostly because you're always getting worse. I am seeing that you're weaker in your right leg. Was there a moment when you finally got that diagnosis where you didn't have that positive mm -hmm. attitude? I mean, you'd be very human yeah. if your heart was broken. I remember crawling into bed with like a bag of M&Ms, party size, and just two to three months of blink from there. It was just survival. I heard there was a turnaround at a wedding yeah. when you were a bridesmaid. Yes, one of my best friends was getting married and I was in the wedding, which you can't hide when you're a bridesmaid. And a couple of my friends were like, why don't we just try to make it really fun? And a couple hours later, we had the bride limboing under my walker. I was giving people walker rides all over the dance floor. Brooke realized if she could get people smiling and laughing, maybe they would hear what she had to say, too. She soon started posting on social media about her ALS journey in her way. Today, we are driving to go borrow my first wheelchair. The pharmacist spent 10 minutes telling me how bad this tastes. I think. People are so scared to talk about a terminal diagnosis and death and what that looks like in a young person. But if you see yourself in me and you're able to laugh with me, then hopefully people are taking away more about ALS. Brooke's posts have since had millions of views. Her series on dating with ALS has been a fan favorite. You did one Instagram post about dating and telling your would-be suitors that you have a cane. Mm -hmm. What were your pickup lines? Dating me is like getting to cut the lines at Disney World. <laughs> She's a 10, but she needs a lot of pick-me-up. <laughs> I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to hold her upright. <laughs> Can you read some of the responses? Because there were some very good ones. I was impressed. Mm -hmm. OK, I see you, Abraham Limpin. <laughs> I feel like we're in the Bible because you're Cain and I'm Abel. <laughs> That's a winner right there. That was a winner. <laughs> if only laughter really were the best medicine, because for ALS, there are very few options. You get diagnosed, they tell you two to five years. Here are three medications that might help you out for a couple of months, and we'll just follow you from there. Which makes the sparkle in Brooke's eyes all the more astonishing. If people know anything about ALS, they think about that ALS ice bucket challenge a few years back. Everyone was doing it, mm -hmm. and people might think they must not need any money at all. Yeah. The ice bucket challenge was a really great step because it helped fund one medication. We still don't have a cure. So the disease, I would still say, is very underfunded. I know being introspective isn't your favorite thing, but something like this must teach you so much. So much. When you picture your future, you kind of picture like a runway. You can picture, you know, travel or career, or growing your family. When I got diagnosed, the future, that runway was just cut off. Like the future no longer exists for me. And that's a heavy thing, but not everything that's changed has been super sad and so I think I'm aware of more of the beauty and kindness in the world now than I was. A new sense. A sixth sense. A sixth sense. I'm the sixth sense. <laughs> <laughs> I see nice people. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed looking at my... And Brooke plans on using her voice even after this disease takes it from her. Yes. So what would you want to tell people? Well, you still can. There are two things that I would ask of people to do. ALS research needs money, so find the ALS organization that speaks to you and give, donate. And then two is follow my story, 
I think we associate ALS with characters who don't look like me. So I want people on this journey with me and know that we're gonna laugh along the way, but don't look away. This next man describes himself as a glass half full kind of guy, a mindset that's helped him overcome some enormous challenges and create a beautiful life. Take a look. Francesco Clark is living a life he could have never imagined. I'm lucky. Mm. I really just feel like I'm living a dream. I love that you just said, I'm lucky and yet you've lived through some pretty hard things. I think life is best acknowledged through the perspective that you look, whatever lens you look through. Yeah. 21 years ago, when Francesco dove into a pool, his life changed forever. Talk to me a little bit about that day. I was 24 years old. I was working in fashion. I was working at Harper's Bazaar, just got promoted, and I felt like I was unstoppable. I dove in thinking it was a deep end. I was paralyzed in the blink of an eye. I became a shadow of myself for three years after. I had to redefine my life in a wheelchair. And not being able to get up and get a glass of water at midnight when you're thirsty or or go out with your friends when you want to. I felt like an infant. I couldn't look in a mirror. I couldn't be in a room. Because what would you see when you looked in a mirror? All I would notice was a wheelchair, and I would burst into tears. I realized that a secondary effect of my injury was that my skin stopped sweating. So I developed rosacea, eczema, and a hypersensitivity to ingredients that every other skincare line uses that made my skin look older. So when I looked in the mirror, it wasn't me and I felt betrayed by my reflection. Francesco's father was a medical doctor also trained in homeopathy and helped his son come up with a unique formula to help his skin. Clark's Botanicals never was a business plan. It was something that I started from a hospital bed to empower myself. It was a psychological and emotional recovery. So how did Clark's help heal you? It helped me connect it helped me feel like a human being again. Friends and family started to notice the improvement in Francesco's skin and they wanted in. In 2008, Francesco's personal project bloomed into a business. And today he is CEO of an award-winning global brand. I can't help but think about how much hope and resilience there is in your story and probably what hard work it took to find that hope. You have to wake up every morning and work at it. Email Raymond. It doesn't just happen. I don't live in a dream that every day is a good day, but you deal with them and you work through them. Francesco's life has become even more full. He found love with partner Alberto Mahelcic Banzana and with the help of a surrogate, welcome twins this past June. Now we have two giggly, chubby babies that really center me <laughs> and make me feel more determined and make me feel calm. <gasps> Our little miracles. <laughs> Look at his smile. Francesco and his family have written their own script and it's a beautiful one. Does this feel like when you have the, these babes in your arms that your family's complete? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is our unit, and this is our purpose. My sense of self is no longer about me, and my existence now encompasses so much more. For me, my spinal cord injury was something that happened, but my life could have ended, mm -hmm. and I could have become a memory of somebody who could have been, instead of somebody who now is. Still ahead, the stay-at-home mom who's turned into a TikTok sensation. We will introduce you to her right after this.
today we're spotlighting a woman who found her true calling a little later in life when she decided to make a dramatic turn and try her hand at comedy. Here's her story. A few years ago, Zarna Gar got an unexpected gift. So how many messages in total came in? I think 140 something. Messages written by friends and family, compiled by her daughter, Zoya. These notes were the final push she needed to try professional comedy. I wept on how much time my daughter spent doing this when she should have been studying for the SATs. <laughs> Growing up in India, Zarna didn't even know what a comedian was. The youngest of four, she was just 14 when her mom passed away. It was a very sudden situation. And my dad, I think her death broke him in some way. So he just decided the next day, he's like, you need to get married. He had no school <laughs> hopes for you, no job no. hopes, just get married? No, and you know, he was not a bad guy. I, like, I didn't hold it against him then, nor do I now. But Zarna had other plans. She decided to move to America and become a lawyer. She got married, started a family, and became a full-time mom. Yeah, three kids, but I was dying inside, dying. I really wanted to get back to work. I couldn't figure out a way out. It was very complicated. Her way out was right in front of her. For years, she'd been entertaining family and friends. If you are good, you will get to see Delhi. <laughs> Quietly perfecting her act. And my daughter is like, mom, people like do this for a living. I'm like, no, they don't. What are you talking about? And then my kids ganged up on me. Her kids convinced her to start performing at open mics around New York City. I'm an immigrant, you guys. I came to America with $9 in my pocket. 10000 in the bank, but 9 in the pocket. <laughs> the Indian people only wrote the ultimate book on sex, to which she responded, we wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> During the pandemic, they also got her to post videos on social media, where more than 200 million have laughed right along with her. Okay, can we please focus? Focus is not a word. It is a word. It is plural of focus is foci. Now, Hillary Clinton and Kevin Hart have cast Zarna on their shows. She's even got her own comedy special in the works. I think what I find so interesting about your story is how much of it was you taking the reins. Oh, but how else is it gonna happen? All because she took comedy seriously. For today, Vanita Nair, NBC News, New York. You've been great, Namaste. Now to the story of a bond between a barber and one of his young clients. Let's see how these two ended up with a viral video that's now been viewed by millions of people. The slang term for a haircut is getting your ears lowered. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi. But this one will get your spirits raised. Hey, go. That's seven-year-old Ellison Eubanks laughing in the barber chair, a sight his mom, Julie, never thought she'd see. You see, for Ellison, who has Down syndrome, haircuts were once on par with root canals. They were sensory overload. I felt like we would leave every appointment kind of, you know, traumatized and he would have even more of a negative view of a haircut than he did before. Then they met Vernon Jackson. You did an awesome job, man. I'm so proud of you. Who just seemed to have the right touch. It's something about Vernon's energy is really cool. Ellison just gravitated towards him right away and he treated him like a human being, like any other client. A couple years ago, Vernon created the Gifted event. Using money donated by the community, he gives free haircuts to kids with special needs, to those who may otherwise feel marginalized. I'm someone like, no, I see you, and I want to address you as you may have seen. I'm here with you through the process. During his second haircut with Vernon in January, Ellison, who's known as a bit of a class clown, suddenly decided to play a game. <laughs> of stop and go. and go, bringing sheer joy. And go. Go. Video of this moment has been watched on TikTok more than three million times. The people that are viewing the video are being healed from their perspective and their stigma and having a little more patience with the children. A valuable <laughs> lesson that thanks to Vernon and Ellison and is getting the green light. You can say go. Yeah, oh, go. Yeah, 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 yeah.
<laughs> it's like their BFF now, you know? Like, he loves going there. He walks in and he gives him a hug and he knows to sit in the chair and he knows that it's a safe place. Hey, we finish. <laughs> After the break, we got another uplifting story for you. You do not want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We couldn't leave you without one more feel-good story. Check it out. It was guaranteed to be a memorable moment, so a man was proposing to his longtime girlfriend on the beach. The young uh, couple's daughter was there to be part of the occasion, but things don't always go as, as planned. So the man first asked the daughter, is it okay if I ask mommy a question? No. She said no. And then moments <laughs> later, mommy put the girl down. After she took a few steps, guess what? She spotted the camera. So she did what any toddler would do, oh go right up to it. Oh wait, this of course, while the whole proposal is happening. <laughs> Romantic proposal on in the background. Um, yeah. <laughs> she said yes. Um, <laughs> oh, that's that's framed there. perfectly. That's great. It's actually oh, perfect. By the way, they're in hysterics, I love it. Uh, anyway, there you go. Great. Isn't that a good one? That's that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Boost, and we hope you are feeling the power of positivity after today's show, and we'll see you back here tomorrow on Today All Day. And thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. We're back with more insider tips and the latest consumer news. From warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, a look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13 year old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. 
As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car is telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology but the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal. Telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. 
The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest, or inject them. There are no FDA-approved generic versions of these substances, and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Admit my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget. Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important. But an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93% since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foos purchased a policy from Trupanion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foos says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, 
Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foos says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, a look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. 
A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first-year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible, and you're going to be hungry during the day, so have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and go. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. Crashy also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live when okay. you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yes. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you gotta start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list, and the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat yes. nutritiously, but this stuff is expensive, and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star, what, like 24 <laughs> hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on. You're going to pay like $5 for poor little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro. It's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups, you can use it to make eggs, anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carlos suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yes! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin. All right, all right, so that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this 
This is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here. NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so much you? for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, yeah. through the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. You. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, you know, your right foot's going down to the gas and it's like at an even motion. So a lot of people kind of dump the clutch and that's when you get like the big turkey jerky. Did you bring a bark bag? Yeah. There we go. All right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo, yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo, super fun mode. Yeah, super fun mode. <laughs> what do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting, becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper, too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. On the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls. And I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Minnie Land's dolls representing children with Down syndrome. 
and Mattel's Fashionista line, featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mm -hmm. Jilly Bing! <laughs> Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or four hundred. Um, we start out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little <laughs> who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. <laughs> Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles, and it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at The Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. With coastline that stretches for more than 60 miles, South Carolina's Grand Strand is home to some of America's most beautiful beaches. Here in Myrtle Beach, family-friendly activities, energetic nightlife, and natural attractions have made this place a tourist hotspot for decades. As a beach town, seafood's a real star of the show here. From crispy fried fish to creative daily specials, and of course, Carolina classics like shrimp and grits. I'm here to savor every last bite of this city's freshest catch. Let's dive in. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Fresh seafood has been a big draw to Myrtle Beach since the late 19th century, according to historian Becky Billingsley. They would have these huge nets out there on the beach that took like 20 people to grab the nets and pull them in. Then they had these little fish shacks set up on the beach where they could fry the fish. And so you could also get a fish dinner right there on the beach. 
Today, Myrtle Beach welcomes over 19 million tourists each year, and its food scene has evolved from simple beach shacks to more than 2,000 restaurants feeding all those hungry visitors. So even if fishing isn't your thing, there are plenty of ways to enjoy Carolina's freshest catch. Merle's Inlet is a charming fishing town just 25 minutes from downtown Myrtle Beach. This quaint area is actually known as the seafood capital of South Carolina. I'm at Seven Seas Market, a community favorite that's known for its impressive variety of local fish. Each day, the fishermen here are hauling in everything from shrimp to grouper, mahi-mahi, and more. Some might say it's shrimply the best. Hey, Al. Hey there. How you doing? Chris Conklin has been running this place for 15 years. We're able to source the finest fresh local seafood known to man with our own fishermen and our own boats. His son Christopher, already a seafood fan, often coming to help out. Bingo, I see who's going to be taking over the Thank business. Seven Seas was founded by Chris's dad, Phil Conklin, in 1985. So this is a giant bluefin tuna. That, um, there's Phil, my dad. Phil was an engine man in the Navy, later becoming an avid sports fisher. After a visit to Merle's Inlet, he fell in love with the marsh's bountiful catch and was inspired by local markets that caught and sold their own seafood. We own six of our own boats now that fish for the snapper and grouper, and we have two shrimping boats as well. Merle's Inlet has a long history of commercial fishing. Until the mid-20th century, slaves and black Americans who harvested fish here were known as Creek Boys. Following the Civil War, it became a paying job for any skilled fisherman. And they were young men who would have several families that they caught seafood for. The area's unique geography lends itself to a wide variety of fish and shellfish. So that inlet in between the ocean and the land is an interesting mix of brackish and fresh water. And that's where we get our oysters and clams and crabs and really unique, fresh, not too salty, but just salty enough. Today, Merle's Inlet is a hotspot for nightlife with plenty of restaurants and bars, but few seafood markets remaining. Seven Seas is one of the last places still catching and selling its own fish. How are we doing? Hey, fellas. What's going on? Hi. Have a good trip? Indeed. Oh, yeah. Nice. For Chris, a passion for seafood started as a kid. At 12 years old, he got his first fishing boat on the weekends, catching flounder to sell at Seven Seas. He joined his dad full time after college. We were like best friends, you know, we work all day, sweat, blood, tears, whatever. In the early 2000s, Chris's best childhood friend, Henry Ford, joined the business. We did a bunch of hunting and fishing together. Chris is like a brother to me. Henry soon became like a member of the family. The trio worked together until Phil's passing in 2018. It was a big, a huge loss, but he's got to pick your chin up and keep on. Henry taking on more responsibilities. Today, he's a co-owner at Seven Seas. So the art to a very good fish display is uh, to make them look like they're all swimming. The market offering up to a dozen local seafood options from red snapper, bluefin tuna, to grouper, flounder, oysters, and of course, shrimp. They also bring in seafood from all across the country. Under Chris, they've expanded beyond retail, supplying several fine dining establishments across the city. Yeah. How about this good looking seafood we brought to you? Chris is proud carrying on his father's fishing legacy. A lot of customers, they hold us near and dear to their heart and they, they like to brag, so uh, I enjoy being people's seafood guy. Time to see the seafood guy in action. Seven Seas processing thousands of pounds of fish and shrimp daily. I helped unload the market's latest catch, South Carolina white shrimp. Take it right up there to the scale. All right, here we go. On a good week, how many pounds will you, you sell of these? Um, a thousand pounds a day in the summertime. A thousand yes, pounds a day? Just shrimp, yes sir. The shrimp gets covered in a layer of ice. The final step? A lesson from Chris and Henry in the fine art of cleaning and deheading shrimp. What we do is we take the shrimp up like this. Uh -huh. And every shrimp you touch, you have to pinch it. Uh -huh. Why? Right? To pinch the head off, right? Oh, oh. The shrimp get organized into three sizes, medium, large, and extra large. 
What makes South Carolina shrimp special? They come from really clean water. We don't have a lot of mud, and they're much sweeter. Can you taste a shrimp and tell whether it's come from South Carolina or not? 100% I yeah. can, yes sir. Wow, how about you, Henry? Yeah, absolutely. Coming up, I get a taste of South Carolina's famous shrimp. After prepping a mountain of shrimp at Seven Seas Market, I couldn't wait for a taste of this fresh catch. Co-owner Henry Ford whipping up a spread of local shellfish steamed to perfection with their house blend of spices. And I've even got some uh, stone crab claws Chris and I went and caught yesterday. Wow, this is great. So, do you ever get tired of seafood? Absolutely not. I could, not at all. I could eat seafood every day if I could. Seven Seas also sells several house-made specialties, many crafted by Henry, including a smoky fish dip and a Carolina favorite, she crab soup. What is she crab soup? It's crab meat, um, and it's a cream-based soup. Oh, wow. And we sell out of it every day. Woohoo! Oh, yes, sir. I can see why. Just being surrounded by seafood all day isn't enough for these two. They find time every week to hop on a boat and reel in a catch together. So when you guys, Henry, are out on the boat uh, fishing, what's it like? Oh man, it's, it's actually, after being at work all week, it's actually heaven on earth to get out there. Chris, how important is it to continue this legacy of, of South Carolina seafood? We're like the last of the Mohicans. You know, it's a lot easier to get seafood from other places, other countries. We go through all the trouble of having our own boats and trying to perpetuate what little bit is left of the South Carolina seafood industry. That's why we stay so busy. Well, I gotta tell you, this is some of the best shrimp I've ever had. Yep. Oh, man, this is great shrimp. Oh yeah, it's good. You know what, for all your hard work today, after this lovely meal we filled your belly, I wanna give that to you as a Ooh. gift from Chris and I, saying thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. You're part of the crew now. Al. All right, aye aye, Captain.
My definition of soul food is food that is made with love and care. My mom used to always tell me, son, don't never make anything or never sell anything that you wouldn't need. So that's my definition of soul food. Word has it, if you're looking for some real soul food in Myrtle Beach, Big Mike's has the best soul food in town. Born and raised in Myrtle Beach, owner Mike Chestnut is a well-known member of this community, bringing people together with recipes from his mom's kitchen for over a decade. Just, just like from Mama's house. And I'm like, man, this is delicious. I can't think of any soul food restaurant that I go to that is better than this. Time to meet Big Mike. Nice Welcome to, to see Big Mike. Yes, Mike. sir. Good to I'm see out. you. Hey. All right. Yes, so sir. You guys all work here, right? Yes, yep. sir. Yep. From Big Mike to Little Lennox, Big Mike Soul Food isn't just family owned. You got all family from top to bottom. My wife, Maxine, she works here. And then also my oldest son, Michael, and my youngest son, Marcus, and my daughter, Michaela. It's the whole family. I mean, it's a family reunion. You know, the whole ball of Yes, sir. <laughs> Mike Chestnut, AKA Big Mike, has spent his entire life in Little Beach, and he's become a well-known figure about town. He's always willing to give a hand to anybody who needs it, and he also takes pride in his work. Since I grew up here, I just want to feel like I'm giving back to the community. I serve as a deacon at our church and city councilman, involved in a lot of other organizations, whether it's the NAACP or American Culinary Federation. And then the restaurant, that's my, that's my true love, I'll be honest with you. Where'd your love of food come from? I would got to say it's from my mom. She could get in the kitchen at seven o'clock in the morning and just had fun at what she was doing. Big Mike's mom, Rosalie Chestnut, worked in many restaurants in the area as a cook. With her encouragement, her son's kitchen career began at just 12 years old as a dishwasher. But it didn't take long for his diligence and talent to shine through. The chef that was there, he just saw something in me, and I remember he went to the general manager and said, hey, I want Mike to come back and prep with me. Mike worked the line at a country-style restaurant while going to school for not one, but two culinary programs. For nearly 20 years, Mike rose in the kitchen ranks, but he always dreamed of owning his own business. Mike soon found the answer to his prayers in a familiar spot. We um, saw this building, it was ready, and time was right. The high school used to be in the shopping center across the street, and we would actually jump the fence and come over here and eat lunch and go back. But who would have ever thought that 40 years later we end up buying the place? Sadly, Mike's mother passing away before she could see him fulfill his dream. What do you think she would think of this place? I think she would be proud of us to say you're trying to do something to keep the family together and mm -hmm. also provide a living and feed the family. What's the best advice you gave you? People always eat with their eyes. So if it looks good, it's going to be good. Uh, oh, man, does this look good. Sweet yams, mac and cheese, fried chicken, collard greens. Those are just a few of Big Mike's soul food specialties. Seafood basket, catfish with fries. Obviously, seafood is a big deal. Yes, sir. Here. Mm -hmm. What do you do seafood-wise? We do um, fried whiting, and then we do catfish. Serving up seafood is a sure way to catch diners' attention here in Myrtle Beach. Big Mike Soul Food carries on a culinary legacy that's steeped in history. The term soul food was coined in the 1960s as a source of pride for many African Americans. But the cooking tradition has evolved over centuries and continents. African Americans, when, when they were forced to live here, they had to do what they had to do. So they incorporated what we had here into the taste they had there, and they incorporated their master's taste too. So it all merged together to be a French, English, Scottish, Dutch, African American, Native American melting plot of flavors. Soul food restaurants began popping up all over the United States as black Americans migrated from the rural South, many becoming integral to their local communities. Is it important to have a, a, a black owned oh, yeah. restaurant? No question. As no part question. of the, the food scene? Yes, sir. It, it lets the community know, hey, if Mike can do it, I can do it. Because I tell people, you know, I grew up in a little area outside the city called Race Path. A lot of drugs, a lot of crime, and who would ever thought that we would be able to open up a restaurant in the heart of Myrtle Beach. I couldn't wait to get into the heart of this restaurant, the kitchen. 
We're going to do a Big Mac special today, meat and three. A signature meal of the South, meat plus three, three sides that is, started popping up in urban diners in the early 1900s. We're going to do some fish, we're going to do some hush puppies and some coleslaw oh. and some mac and cheese. All right, let's All right. get started. All right, well, we're going to start with some um, hush puppies over here. Hush puppies made from cornmeal batter can be sweet or savory. We probably go through a couple hundred of them, and wow. we do them all by hand. Let them cook for them a little minute. All right. And then we're going to come back over and do the fish. All right. Um, my fish is going in a, in a cornmeal batter, and we add a little bit of extra seasoning to them. This is that a little special little thing? special season that we make up there. It's nice and light batter on it. Right. With our fish and first side in the fryers, Mike whips up some coleslaw. Starting with all the usual fixings, cabbage, mayo, vinegar, but Big Mike has another secret ingredient up his sleeve. Some people don't put relish in it, but I put relish in mine. Relish? Oh, that's good. And the sweetness of the uh, relish. And that relish, I would have never thought of adding in. relish. And with our fish a golden brown, hush puppies fried to perfection, and coleslaw ready to serve, time for the third side, mac and cheese. Just how his mama made it. There we go, Ooh. Big Mike special. Oh, oh my God. Get a hidden spot. I mean, it's so light. Yes, sir, yes, sir. It's not a heavily breaded fish. I'm a huge hush puppy. Okay. It's got, it's got this sweetness to it. Yes, sir. That is about as good as it gets. All right. Wow. Wow is right. I haven't had flaky fish like this since I was a kid back in St. Albans, Queens. I clean my plate, just like everybody else who walks through the doors here. I just want to leave something for my grandkids and kids to say, hey, this is a family thing and we want to keep it going. Just a stone's throw from the shore is Myrtle Beach's Arts and Innovation District. Winna's Kitchen is one of the newest restaurants in this part of town. Here, Chef Jess Sagan is delighting tourists and locals alike with her elevated brunch tables. She's also on a mission to give back to the community, extending a helping hand with warm meals to those in need. Hey, Al, nice to, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, so glad to be here. Well, what's going on here? It seems like there's a lot of These cool are, kids hanging out here. They are. These are our grandchildren, my daughter Kenzie and her five kids. Now, you usually don't find kids studying at a restaurant, but here at Winna's Kitchen, owner Jess Sagan loves keeping her family close by. So close, in fact, that all five of her grandchildren are homeschooled right here in the basement. So there's always time for a bit of family fun. I'm on a rock right now. I'm on a base and I can't get down. I'm not in Jess's daughter, Kinsey, doesn't just teach here. She's also the co-owner and deeply invested in the heart and soul of this culinary adventure. I'm the brains and she's the brawn, but she's also the brains. I do a lot of the creative elements of the menu, but the day-to-day -day kitchen line 
restaurant is Kinsey. Even the name of the place is a nod to family. My mom's name was Linda. Her nickname was Winna. And when my mom passed away, she had a lot of regrets. And I knew that opening a restaurant was something that I would have a regret about mm. if we didn't give it a shot. It was pursuing a dream, but also investing in a community that we believed in. At Winna's Kitchen, those facing homelessness are able to enjoy a meal totally free of charge. We say this all the time. We didn't open a 30-seat restaurant to make a lot of money. We opened a 30-seat restaurant to make an impact. And how do you do that? Our patrons can pay $5, and they'll either hang a card, it'll say number one, and we'll feed somebody for it, or they can take that card with them, and if they see somebody out on the street that they think needs it, they can give it to them. But our goal is to kind of restore dignity to people. They get to sit down at a table or the bar and be served. It's a calling that stems from her own journey. There was a point in your life where things were pretty tough. In my mid to late 20s, I, I took a leave of sanity, I say. I just checked out and I ended up making some really bad choices that led me into a place of addiction and ultimately homelessness. Then I ended up going to live at the rehab program for homeless people and I completed that program and 20, almost six years later, here we are. In rehab, Jess met her future husband, Walt, a volunteer from a local church program. Back on her feet, she devoted her professional life to her faith, serving as a worship pastor for two decades. What led you to opening up a restaurant? It is the food. We love to eat, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Jess and Kinsey got their start in the food world by catering benefits for a local nonprofit. After a string of successful dinners, they took the plunge, opening Winna's Kitchen in 2021. The first item on their menu, the free number one special. So what, what about for the folks who come in who need that meal? What, what's their reaction? The number one reaction we get is they are so hesitant to let us serve them. We often have people, they're like, hey, if, do you need help with the dishes? And I'm like, no, you're a patron. Jess doesn't stop at serving free meals. She's given many a second chance, employing people who have faced addiction or homelessness. Not a lot of restaurants give back to the community. How did that evolve? So there's this passage of scripture. When you invite people uh, to your house for a meal, invite the lowly in. And um, I would say it's easy to do nice things for people who are gonna do nice things for you. But the real gift in the kingdom for us is is doing things for people who can't do anything for you. And showing up for people who can't show up back. And loving people who might not ever love you back or even appreciate you back. That's really investing in people. And that's who we want to be. I mean, it's, it's like, like dignity is on the menu. It is. Dignity is on the menu. Kinsey is just as passionate about her mother's mission. I'm so proud of my mom. You're doing great, sweetie. I love you. She has experienced such a hard life, and her attitude, her ability to overcome is just, I think most people would just lay down and give up, and she, it just drives her to do more and be more. She teaches her kids at Winners so they can learn from their grandma's compassion on a daily basis. She is nice to everyone, and she's independent at the same time. The legacy my mom will give us is not this building, it's how she taught us to treat each other, how she teaches us to interact with each other. In addition to helping others, Jess is also dedicated to highlighting seasonal, locally sourced ingredients. My grandparents were very farm to table, I mean, before farm to table was a thing. Uh -huh. Both my sets of grandparents had gardens that we ate off of all summer. We're in the South, there's a lot of fried chicken and a lot of French fries and a lot of fried everything. But my daughter and I both like food that's a little bit different, a little bit elevated. The mother-daughter duo putting their spin on brunch classics like fluffy ricotta pancakes with lemon curd and a deconstructed chicken pot pie. Oh man, that was the best dessert I've ever had. But there's one dish that's been a menu mainstay since the beginning. When it comes to Jess's take on this Southern classic, the sauce is the boss. What's the thing that makes your shrimp and grits so special? It's our sauce. It's kind of this 
mix between cream and tomato. And it's infused with some secret spices and some ham stock. Maybe you'd show me how this is done? I'd love to. When is shrimp and grits? Starts with, of course, the shrimp. We try to use large local shrimp. They're really sweet. They got the perfect amount of salt. Stock gives her signature sauce a richer flavor. How do you make your ham stock? We don't share all of our secrets ah, here. Ah, okay, all righty. Just then searing the shrimp in clarified butter, seasoning them with Kinsey's secret spice blend. It does have salt, pepper, garlic, a little bit of dill, and a little bit of something, something else. Something, in it. something, and a little and something, something. I'm not being coy. I don't no, know, no. You... I don't know what she puts in. <laughs> and what's shrimp and grits without cheesy grits? Each batch made fresh every morning. Well, now, what kind of cheese is that? The main cheese in here is some coastal cheddar. The shrimp finished with a drizzle of buttery love. Then, time to plate it up. So we're going to let you help finish this off. All right. This is a little bit of uh, Parmesan that mm -hmm. we've just kind of chunked up. To top it off, cherry tomatoes and some microgreens. And of course, the best part, tasting. That's fantastic, Jess. When you present something like this to the community, how much pride does this bring you and Kinsey? I think it's why we do what we do. You know, shrimp and grits is a very, really a humble dish. And we've just taken it and put a ton of care into it. When I was growing up, people would say, love is a secret ingredient. It's true. And so elevating food is not just about making it fancy. It's about taking the level of care to make it look a certain way. Yeah. And I think that adds to nourishing people not just with the food they eat but their spirit too. Well, my spirit feels very good right now. <laughs> mm. Whether you're looking to kick back with casual beachy fare or enjoy elevated modern menus, Myrtle Beach is a seafood lover's paradise. The very best of South Carolina's most beloved dishes can all be found right here. And there's no doubt that the thriving restaurant community shapes the heart and soul of this vibrant coastal city. This episode of Family Style is sponsored by Visit Myrtle Beach. Good Wednesday morning, that powerful storm unleashing its fury overnight. And the next threat is already on the way. Good morning.